Hello everyone, I'm Giulio Prisco and I would like to welcome you all, speakers and organizers and uh, attendees and listeners to this edition of the Teresem Space Day Colloquium. Uh, we're going to have a very intense program with very uh, great speakers whom um, I'm going to introduce now. Uh, this uh, edition of the colloquium will be focused on long-term perspectives on space expansion. And it's uh, taking place today, July 20, which is the anniversary of the first human landing on the moon. Very sad to think that uh, it's now 54 years since we saw that, but uh, I'm confident and I look forward that we will see people walking on the moon again soon. So who are today's speakers? First uh, is uh, Chris Mason, who, has written this really fascinating book on uh, the next 500 years and how we might engineer life to reach uh, new worlds and even much more than that, but uh, Chris is going to talk about it. Huh? Uh, we will have uh, Tom Bell, one of the two co-founders of uh, Extropy Magazine, who uh, is now focusing on writing about uh, politics and new innovative forms of government. Tom is going to talk about the uh, governments of communities spread out across the vastness of space. And the other co-founder of Extropy Magazine and founder and first president of Extropy Institute, uh, Max Moore, who doesn't need an introduction. We'll talk about the ex extropic frontier, existential opportunities, of the cosmos. We will have uh, Clément Vidal, the author of this other really fascinating book that I very warmly recommend, titled The Beginning and the End, The Meaning of Life in a Cosmological Perspective. And he will uh, give a talk with a very intriguing title, The Universal Life Cycle, The New Sphere, Stellivores and Immortality. Uh, on the world building and science fiction side, we will have two speakers, Todd uh, Drashner and uh, Trond Nielsen, to describe this awesome Orion's Arm collaborative uh, science fiction world building project, which has uh, produced the sprawling Encyclopedia Galactica together with novels, uh, books, short stories, and all. And uh, another speaker is uh, Stellar Magnet. Mm, she's a space activist uh, and a philosopher and uh, uh, organizer, and I don't know what else, who will be speaking about the United Confederation of Cosmists, igniting a bottom up interstellar network ecology. So I'm just uh, now going to give the floor to the speakers. Starting with Chris, the floor is yours, Chris. Great, thanks, you very, thank you very much for the introduction. And also, can you uh, see and hear me okay? Hopefully, uh, let me yes, know we can. You're coming soon. Okay, great. I will jump right in and uh, begin the talk and um, yeah, just take away right away into the adventure. So, I want to walk everyone through some of the work that we've done in my laboratory and also describe a little bit of some work in, in uh, the book, my mo more recent book uh, about the next 500 years and walk everyone through that. So uh, I'll, I'll quick with, with a bit note of disclosures is um, do work. I'm a co-founder of several companies and work with a, a large number of biotech companies, a lot of them to get technologies out into space and serve as really good colleagues and collaborators uh, you can see here. Um, so I want to note really that more than ever we are a space-faring species if you look at what happened since 1957 and as you noted in 69 we had really a, a race between the us and china to get objects launched into space and crews into space and you can see it started to diversify in the latter part of the last decade but then actually it very quickly became a much more of a slight increase into a super exponential increase in the number of objects and crews launched into space you can see here it jumped up quite quickly 
uh, a lot of this being driven by Starlink and SpaceX work to now make you know thousands of objects being launched into space per year. And last year actually was the record for the most number of launches into space with almost every few days uh, something being put up in this space. Pretty extraordinary. And this opens the doors to a lot of new directions. So in particular, you can think about building uh, lunar base. This is one of the architectural renderings of a moon base that's coming with the European Space Agency being planned out. So we will hopefully uh, reach that vision you were just described of getting back to the moon and going there to stay. And you can even, you know, imagine uh, some experiments that already happened being more expanded, like growing plants on the moon, as was done in the Chiang 4, and eventually even getting multiple space stations around Earth and going back and forth between uh, low Earth orbit and the moon and LEO. So we have a lot of activity uh, you know, that's really burgeoning this new era of space, really, I'd even call it a second space era because of the amount of activity and the commercial activity and the degree of activity that is all uh, quite, quite distinct. And this creates kind of a new space race. So China wants to get to Mars by 2033. Uh, maybe the US and European and Japanese partners might get there around the same time, but uh, that, that is sort of the, uh, you know, some of the plans are in the works and kind of a new space race. And so with all this excitement, of course, it's easy to get you know intrigued and excited, but it is also a, a paramount for all of us to understand what happens to the body on the way to these other destinations outside of LEO. Can we keep the humans safe? Can we monitor their health and on the mission as well as when they come home? And how do we pre pre prepare for future missions, uh, new planets, uh, really entirely new adventures for humanity? So the first chance we got to actually begin to look at this question was with a, a mission we did with NASA, I called the NASA Twin Study, where we put one twin, Scott Kelly, up into space for a full year, and his control astronaut uh, stayed on Earth uh, for that year. And also there's now Senator Kelly, so at the beginning of the political genetics project we've started in my lab. But what's exciting about this is we had a chance to see what happens you know, if you launch up into space for a year. Uh, when he made it up there, he was, you know, astronaut Kelly was able to take some wonderful pictures out in space. He, of course, did some fun experiments like juggling up in space. He grew a zinnia flower. He was able to get that growing uh, quite well and, you know, made his way back home. But when he did get home, this is some uh, footage of the first time he tried to walk after landing back on Earth. And we know it was okay after a year with no gravity, but you know it wasn't easy either. And uh, some you know adaptation that was needed to get back to being used to just being in gravity. He also had a really uh, severe rash rash that occurred when he landed, and anything that touched any other surface uh, broke out into a rash, including clothing was enough to break out into a rash. And he had flu-like symptoms, and and really wanted to go to the emergency room. And so. Uh, what was interesting is, you know, we, we thought, well, that's, you know, uh, this really sharp reaction to coming back to gravity. And we really wanted to know why. It's what had happened inside of his body that could lead us to changes and could we learn from them and apply to future missions. To examine this question, we looked at every layer of uh, molecular and cellular and physical biology that we could, including changes at the DNA level, epigenetic level, expression, chromatin, antibodies, and immune system, telomeric, cytokines, metabolomics, microbiome, cognition, and vasculature. And we did this every four to five weeks over the course of three years and look for things that would change together. We basically said, can we examine layers of biology that move in concert, which could then indicate co-regulation or disruption? And so particularly one of the things we looked at is what increased in flight, for example, and then was returned back to baseline and which things did not return back to baseline. You can see here for most of the metabolites, most of the microbiome measures, the protein cytokines, the vast majority of the markers uh, across the body you know, did return back to normal. Uh, but some of them were kind of surprising. Like telomeres uh, got longer in space, which was really the opposite of what we expected. Uh, telomeres are at the ends of your chromosomes that keep your DNA intact and are often a sign of aging as they get shorter. But here they got longer in space, almost like the, some longevity was found in space. And so, you know, you also got a couple inches taller in space because of lack of compression on the spinal column. So they actually get a little bit taller in space. And so this led to some fun headlines that, you know, space will make you taller and younger, uh, but it didn't last. It went away as soon as it got back to Earth, as we as we quickly found out. So uh, we wanted to see, though, is, was this just a consequence of being in space or the radiation or the stress on the body? And so we confirmed, actually, uh, that with um, when you climb mountains, even, you get longer telomeres. So we published this work as well and showed that, you know, this was the first glimpse of what happens to the stress on the body. But really, you know, the, what drove that rash is we could see the immune system the day that he landed, this is what drove that phenotype is most certainly what it was creating it, is these changes in interleukins, these sort of, uh, these cytokines that are pro and anti-inflammatory that drive the immune system to regulate cells, which are often increased, for example, during an infection or an injury like IL-6, 
And so it's really the body adapting to these massive changes uh, in the in-flight uh, you know, difference and then landing back on gravity, uh, which is uh, very stressful on the body. So we at least to some degree, we think uh, answered that question and said that there was overall good news in terms of that most of these layers of biology return back to normal, uh, you know, eventually. But we clearly need, you know, more data. This is really the first glimpse of the study. We published this a few years ago. And what I want to present to you now is using some of those same lessons and tools. What we've deployed now is a um, informed consent form and a, a protocol where if anyone's going to space, uh, we've been doing this now for a few years, you're welcome to enroll in our study. Um, so if any of you are going to space, please let me know. We'd love to take, to take some samples and enroll you in our trial. But we've basically been able to, uh, you, know, you know, use some of these lessons and begin to apply this space omics and medical atlas protocol, where we take a lot of the lessons from the twin study and then deploy it for commercial crews and any other future crews to look at a multi-layered view of biology to see where are we observing changes. And the reason we look at PBMCs and sorted blood cells, plasma, stool, urine, saliva, buccal skin, all these metrics, we recapitulate them again is mostly because it's still not clear what the best biomarkers are for stress and where are the places where we can also begin to learn from the data to develop countermeasures, which I'll show you some of this today. So we want to cast a very wide net, I think, over the next 5, 10, 15 years because we have very little data on any astronauts. So we pur purposely are probably oversampling uh, of the types of biology that we need to in a, in a means to find the most uh, relevant markers and also the best metrics for health. So the first chance we got to deploy this was with the Inspiration4 crew, which launched out on uh, almost two years ago into space. And so did pre, during, and post-flight collections using their protocol. And you can see here the day they launched up into space, the rocket loaded, they um, launched up here. You can see here's uh, uh, wonderfully was there for the launch, made their way up into space and, uh, and made safely up into uh, orbit. And you can see they went here actually to a higher altitude than the space station or the Hubble telescope. It went to about 575 kilometers on average. And they, of course, got some up there and they were excited, took some selfie pictures. We're very excited, you can see here. Uh, then they also uh, you know, did some, they got to work. They did some sampling, did hundreds of samples, uh, collected blood samples, did ultra, ultrasound, a lot of work uh, was done. And then they made their way back to Earth, splashed down just fine. And then we got them back up onto the boat. They you know, cheered because they were very excited they made it back. And we got them up onto the, the, the collections, you get the, HEPA, uh, the swabs, the HEPA, HEPA filters, all the um, sampling, and then we got to work. So what we've done over the past uh, you know, year and a half or so since they've returned is a wide range of some of these assays. And I'll present to you uh, today, kind of the middle part of my talk is what have we seen so far from these data? And this is from a series of papers that are all in review right now that we hope we should come out uh, in the next few months. But we, um, I'll start with kind of what we saw for the, what's well, a single cell workflow. We can take each individual cell and profile the cell populations that change, which we could do at much greater granularity than we could do for the twin study. So this technology didn't exist in 2015 and 16 when we started to do the twin study, but now we can look at each individual cell and see what's changing for gene expression. So when genes are activated or repressed and also chromatin. So when DNA is packaged, open and closed and how that changes. And what we could see here is once we sequence and prep these samples, we align them to the genome and begin to analyze their differences. And this is actually one of my favorite things uh, from the study so far is that we can see across, you know, 150,000 cells, we can see T cells, B cells, monocyte populations, uh, natural killer cells. We can profile each of the subclasses of cells in the immune system. So we can go cell by cell to see their changes. And what we've seen is there are many differentially expressed genes. So on the top here, you can see genes go up. Many genes change expression. That's not surprising. Or down in purple because genes are often changing expression. Each vertical line is a gene and each row is a different cell type you can see. And so these are, again, what we would likely find, but we see what are the regions that change it activation, the accessibility, how much did the actual chromatin uh, change its, its profile. We can see the monocyte cell population much more dramatically impacted by spaceflight than any other cell population. So this was you know, really kind of striking finding is that each cell type has its own response to spaceflight. And, and I think more interestingly is that, uh, that you know that's not too surprising because most things in biology are cell type or time specific or both. But we can see that if you look at over the day that they landed from space versus what we look at six months out, the number of differentially expressed genes uh, did decrease and returned back to baseline. And the regions, differentially accessible regions, also mostly returned back to baseline. You can see long-term and post-flight, but not all of them. Right? So in particular, the cell types that are most impacted by spaceflight were the same ones uh, that had the longer recovery, uh, basically CD14 and CD16 monocytes. And so this shows you that very particular cell populations have a different response to spaceflight 
and a different recovery period from spaceflight. That's the first time it's been shown. And so this is interesting. And then we said, well, we have two males and two females. I wonder if we could learn a little bit about the sex differences uh, of these crews. So we look to see how many differently expressed genes uh, are returning the baseline. And is it happening more for males or females? So you can see here, if we just take a ratio of those two, males versus females, that you can see the males have uh, often more changes you can see versus females having less changes. So they return to baseline faster. So we actually recommend for most future crews, this would probably be at least half females because they seem to respond and return to baseline faster than male uh, members so far from these data. And so, for example, the Artemis mission, the Artemis 2 mission that will go back to the moon, it will go around the moon, hopefully in a year or two, uh, is that there's only, only one uh, crew member is female, but hopefully we'll have more females for future crews. So, uh, the other thing we looked at, or a few other things we looked at, was the enrichment analysis. So you take all these genes and say, well, what are the networks? What are the pathways that are changing? And these make sense. We could see chromatin assembly and also telomere stress. Uh, we can see also implicated again in this mission, like we saw for the twin studies. And so uh, that was uh, one result there. We also looked at the microbiome of the crew to see, does the skin microbiome get more similar in flight? For example, if you play a sport, your skin microbiome and microbes will be more similar to your opponents after you play the sport, like basketball, football, roller derby, take your, take your pick. Uh, so we wanted to see in the crews, we did 10, 10 areas of their body to profile what's the differences before and after their uh, the mission. And, and during the mission, and we could actually see here that during the mission, they began to get more similar so their differences got lower, you can see it means they got more similar, and then it stayed that way after the flight. And also they got a lot of species, most of the species were found in the armpit, it's actually one of our favorite results from the study that was a lot of it, um, was the most diverse location in the human body for this crew. Uh, so you might think of your armpit as a, as a uh, wasteland of uh, dark and, and, and demonic species, but it's actually a wonderful rainforest of opportunity and vitality, I'd say. Uh, so the other thing we looked at then is sort of what's happening on the surface of the skin, versus what's happening, you know, the, the swabs and the metagenomics, but then what's happening inside the body and trying to connect these three layers of biology. So to do this, we did spatial transcriptomics. We did a skin punch before and right after the, the mission and, and characterize what happened to the skin. You can see it as the small punches of skin from the crews. And here we did a spatial transcriptomics where we actually can use a digital spatial profile with 18,000 genes and map all the genes that are activated in these skin biopsies and also looked at morphology and we looked at 95 regions of interest uh, across the layers of the skin for these four crew members. And, and then we could profile them before and after flight. And so what we could see is, you know, some of the markers you'd expect for the staining, where we could see some of the, the structure of the skin, as well as even evidence of the vasculature when it's perfusing and getting close to the before and after flight in the skin, versus what we see for the PBMCs. The, Chris, you're cutting out. Do you want to kill your video? Blood uh, so we could see, um, you know, there, uh, how bad is the video? Um, all right, how, is that better at all? I might kill the video feed there. How's that? Does that sound all right? Yep, it sounds better. Better okay, now. Great. Okay, better. I'll keep the video off. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. Worst case, I could record it, uh, you know, if you need to get it. But anyway, this is the, you know, these are the sort of markers of the skin you can see here. And uh, we could look at the difference between peripheral uh, blood and there's the skin, skin cells we could see. And you can see there's actually pretty different, pretty large differences. So what's changing on the skin is, is much different from what's inside the blood. There is some overlap between these genes here you can see, but for the most part, it was actually quite distinct. Uh, these re represents very different re reactions to space flight, you can see here. And um, so the other thing we're doing, our last thing I want to highlight for some of this data is we did a profiling of the proteome and the secretome, sort of what's excreted in the body. Uh, before and after the mission, and we did proteomics and extracellular vesicles and, and sort of uh, pro, um, proteins of what was happening sort of in, in the body and did metabolomics and proteomics. So from both plasma and extra ves extracellular vesicles, we could actually see, you know, after filtering, a, a fair amount of overlap between what's present uh, free-floating in the blood versus encapsulated in vesicles. A lot of the same, uh, you know, sort of specific, specific proteins are showing up, but there are here too some differences between them. So each the layer of the biology will have a different response to space flight that we can pick up uh, with these data. And then also, if you look at what else was picked up that was kind of surprising, is if you look on the left, these are in plasma and EVPs, we can see evidence of neurological related peptides and proteins uh, being picked up, as well as if you compare the inspiration for data, we see other tissues that are showing up that you see this 
positive enrichment after play versus negative enrichment. Like some skeletal muscle, of course, is kind of increasing. But the brain peptides were ones that were immediately post-flight and not as much long-term. And then we looked a bit more closely at these data uh, is that what they are, these are brain enriched proteins that are associated with the brain that we think might represent sort of a disruption of the blood brain barrier that we can see immediately post-flight, but do return back to baseline. But this might indicate, you know, some of the, you know, stress on the body and, and, and sure is, you know, strain really on the entire structural biology of the blood brain barrier potentially is something that we've seen in these data as well, which is very I think, fascinating and a kind of a new result uh, that we're looking at now for other crews. So uh, looking ahead, what's next? We are, you know, as I mentioned, looking at other uh, twin study data, looking at other uh, transcriptomics data, comparing this with their uh, missions, and this is now under review for a lot of these data. We're also looking to see for these more consistent changes in the blood, uh, are there different genes genes that we can link to drugs that could potentially uh, target uh, these changes and as be used as countermeasures, something that we're looking at now. Uh, and this also is a paper that's in review and working with David Furman. And we've also, we'll be launching this fall as an aerospace medicine biobank. So if anyone wants to request samples or data from these missions, we should very soon have this be a uh, live that anyone can request uh, these samples and use them in some of their own studies, their own missions to answer follow-up questions. And of course, you are working on ways to make these data accessible, public. This is working a lot with Gene Lab and also uh, the Human Research Program and NASA to make it so anyone can download the raw data. Uh, these, these data have been consented for broad release. So to be the, the largest release of astronaut data, uh, hopefully, again, in about uh, maybe two to three months, we'll have this all up and online and looking forward to be able to use it for the community. So we also got data from Axiom, the Axiom 2 samples that just come. So that's been added to the biobank. Uh, and we are uh, planning for the future for the Polaris Dawn missions is that eventually we'll have uh, the Starship. Well, the first time it launches, it'll be with some of the members of the same crew. Uh, we should see that then you know, there in the future. And it's worth noting that the Starship can get maybe 12 people on at a time. It may eventually fly as many as 100 people at one time into space, which is pretty extraordinary. Uh, and uh, you know, the first time it flew, it did explode and spread particulate matter for miles because it destroyed the launch pad and it had what was called a rapid unscheduled disassembly. So it didn't quite survive the first trip in space. But the fact that it flew and that it's getting so close is really extraordinary, meaning we are probably maybe only one or two years away from seeing uh, the Starship start to fly, which is pretty extraordinary. And finally, we are working to get uh, in-flight genomics working. This is the first test run of a Mark 1C, which also should fly uh, on several missions in this upcoming year to do sequencing right away in space and not have to wait to bring the samples back to Earth. So I'm going to close in the last, uh, you know, the last part of the talk a bit to think about changing from measuring biology. Uh, and quantifying differences and changes in the risk factors to a more granular view of actually defending biology and you know, figuring out how we can add armor uh, to defend against some of these changes and these arrows, uh, these slings and arrows of the radiation and changes on the body. So in particular, we know from work we and others have published that there is an extensive amount of adoxoguanosine or this damaged DNA that you can see in the urine of astronauts during flight that does return back to baseline but it represents a, a biodosimetry response to the radiation. You can see the body uh, eluding out this sort of damaged uh, nucleic acids uh, from their body. And we're trying to characterize you know, these data in a way that we can find it, measure it, and even defend against it. Because we know that you know, in low Earth orbit, it's not too bad. If you look at the millisieverts of radiation that Scott Kelly received one year in orbit as 146 millisieverts, the inspiration four crew is at 575 kilometers. Uh, you know, they're getting in the ranges of tens to hundreds of millisieverts, but if you go to Mars and back, it might exceed the lifetime, uh, like maximum amount of radiation you should get in your entire life as an astronaut, yeah, which would be, you know, potentially, uh, you know, a higher risk, much higher risk than we've seen before. And so this begins to raise the question, could we, you know, we can pharmacologically protect astronauts, we can physically protect them, but although we can't get too heavy. But could we genetically protect astronauts? We, we've talked about this before. Or could we you know, think about the ethics of should we do such a thing? And how do you make humans fit for Mars with every bit of technology that we have? And it seems controversial maybe at first to think, well, could we modify genes to uh, get someone ready for another planet? But we already modify cells and use them in clinical trials for cancer. And we've published, we uh, with a lot of others as well, publish on CAR T cells and modifying cells and then infusing them into patients. Uh, we've also seen more recently that you can you can do somatic CRISPR editing because CRISPR people in vivo in their body to, in this case, cure sickle cell disease, basically turn back on fetal hemoglobin to replace the damaged uh, adult hemoglobin and really make it such that you can treat a disease by using CRISPR in patients. And so this is already being done therapeutically in patients today. So it's no longer, uh, I think, a, a leap to say we should think about doing this. 
in particular uh, for, you know, for potentially astronauts or people going on dangerous missions. And more importantly, you don't have to CRISP, you don't have to modify DNA. Other work in the lab we've been doing is you can take a look at the fabric of life and do epigenetic versions of CRISPR, where you turn on and off genes using CRISPR as a guiding system, but then control the gene expression. So you don't change the genes, you just change how they're activated or repressed. So there's actually a wide range of epigenetic editing effectors that are now published, and this is several of them here. We've been using DCAS9 systems, where it's the same CRISPR-Cas9 system you've probably heard about that has a homing beacon, but now you can bring with it a fusion protein of ways to turn on and off the DNA with, let's say, TET1 or DMT enzymes. In this case, we can activate or deactivate specific space genes. We can actually modify them, turn them down on the left or turn them up over here on the right. We can actually get rapid increase in expression with multiple target constructs, uh, which is very fascinating, I think, to uh, be able to have this kind of power. And we've also been taking lessons from tardigrades, these water bears that can survive in the vacuum of space. When their genome was sequenced and published back in 2016, they found a protein that could help DNA uh, withstand radiation. And we've taken that protein, it's called DCEP protein, and put it into human cells and see that it moves to when you do one grave radiation at 24 hours, you can see that the tardigrade protein inside human cells moves to where the DNA bricks are and helps with the repair process. And so we think tools like lessons from tardigrades, lessons from all creatures could help us survive in space, or maybe someday even help Mars become self-reliant to find basically organisms that can adapt to radiation and actually adapt to different amounts of carbon dioxide and survive on Mars, for example. And so this is one of those questions, you know, could we make uh, plants and animals that could survive on Mars? You know, could we actually have uh, organisms that could do that? Well, we take lessons from creatures on Earth today that we know are surviving high carbon environments and sometimes at the bottom of the ocean. This is Braden Tierney from our group collecting samples. Uh, and you can see we've already found one of the cyanobacteria that so far is the world record holder in eating carbon dioxide that we could probably bring with us to Mars to help us prepare it uh, for us to live there as we think. So I'll close in the last couple of minutes on a philosophical note is, is the big question I often get is, is why why do all this work to go into space when we have, of course, poverty and there's other diseases, other challenges to, to face humanity? And I want to give three good, good, clear reasons for why all this work I think is important. One of them is that we can do both. We can cure other diseases and explore space and prepare for other planets. We can do these at both at the same time. That we don't have, um, you know, unlimited resources, but we can put people on the moon and, you know, pass civil rights legislation in the United States. We can definitely do two things at once. The other point I'd say is it is a, is a real intangible asset of hope. If you can look at the sky and look at the moon at night and know that people are planning to put uh, habitats there, planning to do experiments there, planning to reach for the stars, that is hopeful. That is inspiring to the next generation, to the current generation, and it's something that is a wonderful asset for humanity. But the third reason uh, may even be the most important is that as far as we know, uh, life, we're the only life forms in the universe so far. And uh, life is precious. Life uh, can disappear. Birds have been disappearing across North America. We know that microbes have been disappearing before we can even uh, sequence them. They've been uh, disappearing. We can't, we can, or we can even find them. And this is not the first time, of course. There have been five times in Earth's history as the temperature has fluctuated up and down over the past 500 million years that we have seen mass extinctions. When the temperature goes too high or too low too fast, that's when we see large scale mass extinction, as you can see here. And so that was just the last 500 million years. If you zoom out a little bit more and think about when there used to be a snowball Earth 700 million years ago and put the last 500 million years in the context of the past and likely future of our planet, we're in this in a very nice but temporary temperature canyon where we have liquid water on our planet and it should stay that way. But we know that in about a billion years, it'll get hot enough to boil the oceans and we may not be able to uh, survive much past that and certainly not past two or three billion years. So there's a fixed time period where we can uh, survive on this planet before the sun engulfs the Earth. And this is something I think about uh, almost every day when I wake up is thinking about this fixed time point that we can stay on this planet. And so we uh, uh, think about what's at risk here, human life, of course, but there's producers, consumers, all the panoply of life on earth is at risk. There's three kinds of life, but I argue to you that there is actually a fourth kind of life, which is the only kind of organism that can be aware of the frailty of other life or that kind of can serve as a guardian of life forms, which is really only human. So far, only humans I think you have some problems with the audio. But now we have a different time. We can think about our 
uh, to all life of the present, future, and fair use being owned, and then putting it and being brought to life. So you could even imagine bring back, say, like the woolly mammoth, uh, or you could imagine bring back and preserving other species, uh, or even the dodo, even though we caused its extinction, there's a chance we could bring it back as well. And this is ongoing work at Colossal. So I argue that this is our duty to all life, the current and future life, and eventually uh, the past life as well as, 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 as we move ahead. And with that, I want to thank everyone in lab who's made this work possible and fabulous to work with, as well as uh, the more recent picture of the lab. I'm, I'm very honored I get to work with all these fabulous people. And thanks to uh, funding from NASA, SpaceX, World Quant, the NIH. And thanks again to my friends, colleagues, collaborators. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, great presentation, Chris. Uh, now, I do have a question for you, but uh, before asking mine, I want to see if uh, others have questions for Chris. Yes, I have one. Luke. Um, so I don't have my camera right now because it's not in the right position. My question is, um, that was very interesting, Chris, and it made me think, uh, I was wondering if you're familiar with the SENS Foundation research. A lot of what you're talking about in terms of adapting astronauts to space involves you know, repairing damage, preventing damage, and so on. Are, are you aware of the, the strategies for engineered nature senescence approach? And have you looked into how well that compares to what you need for astronauts? Uh, great question. So we've, we've begun some of those comparisons of you know the, how the cells are regulated long term when they start to shut down. And uh, there's even a senescence net uh, program uh, that is also looking very deeply at senescence for the N NIH program. And so we've just started doing some of those comparisons. That, that's a uh, that's a great great question, and uh, the answer is you know definitely yes. Uh, but it kind of just just started that work. Then. Okay, great, thank you. Luke plus something. another raise hand. Huh? Luke. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Chris. Uh, firstly, lovely to see you again. Um, your your book, Five Next Five Hundred Years, was one of the best books I read last year. So, uh, yeah. um, uh, it's it's a real right. joy to see you again. I, I wanted to ask you a question that I I asked you previously on on the Futures podcast, but I think it's one that's important for this community specifically, which is we all hear about seasteading, the possibility to do certain things in international waters, but what about space steading? How could we use space as a place to do proactionary experiments for the future? Future of humanity. Oh, I think Chris may have frozen. Yeah, I see him frozen. Let's uh, give him a couple of minutes to recover because it happened before and he recovered uh, in a few seconds. Yeah, I think Tom and I will both be talking about that too later on in the session. Uh, let's, uh, no, I think he may have dropped off so that, uh, but wait, just for curiosity, Clément, what was your question for Chris? So we have it on the record at least. Sure. Uh, so I was thinking about another, uh, organism besides tardigrade that, that can survive very okay. well in, in space. It's, uh, the, the bacteria <clears throat> Micrococcus radiodurans that yep. has x-ray uh, repair mechanisms, which is quite counterintuitive because natural selection has no, no reason to, to develop an x-ray repair mechanism because the, the atmosphere filters x-rays. And so- the case is back. Did you? Yeah, yeah but so I, I switched to connecting on my phone because the Wi-Fi at the hotel ah. is not as good as my phone. So I'm just, I switched over. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the question was a bit on uh, you know, I guess I missed the beginning, but radio, uh, Dinococcus radiodurans is another great exemplar for sure for a species that can survive. Also, certain strains of Bacillus subtilis are really extraordinary and also have survived the vacuum of space. And so I think we actually have a rad a radiation, what we call it the rad team in lab, which is just scanning the genomes of every radio resistant species and beginning to integrate them into some of our new uh, cell constructs uh, to see how high we can get radiation resistance for human cells. Um, as you know, it's not to be deployed in humans yet, but it's just in, in vitro models to see how far we can uh, take evolutionary lessons from other species and bring them into human constructs. Okay, and uh, Luke, uh, I think you just have to repeat your point. I don't think uh, Chris heard you. Luke? Maybe, maybe, maybe lost Luke. 
Okay. Yeah, no, uh, right. Sorry Please. about that. <laughs> I was having some of the tech issues. Good, Chris. Yeah. It, was, it was just a, a very simple um, question. It was uh, so we talk about seasteading and then the idea of doing experiments in international waters, but of course, space offers the possibility of space steading, the ability to take a proactionary approach to the way in which we do science and experimentation. So, uh, so what do you think of that idea? The idea of being able to use space as the reason to do some of these. Um, these uh, interventions into the human body. It, it is a, an, an undiscovered country that we could try entirely new clinical trials or even new kinds of government. And I know some of this talks today at the symposium will will start to look at that. And I, it is a, it is like the Wild West in the United States when it was when it was explored. You know, different regional governments had different approaches to governing, uh, resource management, medicine. So I, I'm sure we'll see some of the exact same. Uh, you know, kind of uh, exploratory views of, of society and humanity. Uh, yeah, I almost guarantee, especially with, with with China. I think they're they're uh, less regulated generally than some of the US or ESA, uh, you know, agencies. And so uh, we've already seen that uh, they'll they'll probably push the border. I think faster than other countries, if I were to guess. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm afraid we don't have any more time for further questions to Chris. We are only touched by an email. Anyway, so thank you very much, Chris. And I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, who is a stellar magnet, who is uh, now switching her webcam on, the beautiful virtual background. The floor is yours, Stellar. Yes. Hello, everyone. I am just trying to sort out how to properly share my screen here. Give me a second. Um, what are you using? Mac, iPad, yeah, phone? Yeah, I'm using a Mac. I'm just a bit confused by the Zoom. Uh, then the you moment. see a bot a button share screen. If mm -hmm. it's not at the bottom of the screen, no, then no, it I'm, is at I'm, the top. I'm there. Uh, I think it's just, uh, oh, I see. Okay, keynote. Um, it's just not really showing me previews. So let me see if this works. Take your time. I'm sorry about this. Okay, I, I think I have to quit Zoom and reopen. I'm sorry. Um, uh should we switch uh no let's not switch just the quick uh okay 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 thank you okay so uh waiting for her do you have a time for another question chris sure sure yeah uh yeah as a matter of fact uh, two other questions first uh, if there is one thing that your uh, talk really persuaded me of is that uh you know, sending human people to space and making sure that uh, they stay in good health is uh, doable, but uh, it's going to be hard. Mm, in view of that, uh, why not just uh, wait a couple more decades, perhaps, for the development of real artificial intelligence and perhaps mind uploading technology and send AIs or uploading human minds to space? Uh, yeah, with, I think we can pursue both options. We should, you know, um, begin the exploration now, but plan that there'll be a lot of robot friends to help us. And if it really becomes uh, the same, you can send them on their own. Uh, there's, of course, a time delay. I think for the moon, you can get a few seconds of time delay that's manageable. But for Mars, it would be an anywhere from 10 to 25 minutes of a leg. So they'd have to be autonomous. We couldn't control them from Earth. And um, uh, but, but we are, already have a lot of robots there. So I think it's definitely... Um, it, it, we would use them extensively and maybe much more so in the next 10, 20 years. But the, the humans will, you know, eventually, you know, if you look at it, the, the next few billion years, at some point, the humans have to go too, uh, unless we can put all of human thought into robots and send them out of the solar system, which then we'd be effectively be a different species. But I'm fine with that too. If we can, if we can recapitulate most of humanity into a silicon form and hang out that way, uh, I'm fine with it. Yeah. Great. I believe uh, other speakers like uh... Clément and Max will say a few things about that. However, yeah. thank you very much. Great. And I see that Stellar Magnet is back and has managed to share her screen. So I'm giving the floor to Stellar Magnet. All right. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, so yes, I'm Stellar Magnet, and I will be giving a talk right now on how we can create a United Federation of Cosmos um, by igniting a bottom-up uh, interstellar network ecology. Um, so a little bit of background on who I am and how I got to creating a presentation like this is uh, over the past six years, I've been, I would say, a bit of an experiential or self-guided researcher focused on crypto economic network design related to large-scale networks of cooperation. I've contributed to various decentralized autonomous organizations and open source projects um, with mechanism design, tooling, and governance. Uh, but as far as my background goes, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Berkeley back in 2008 and uh, Astronautical Engineering Certificate that I got in 2016. I'll talk more about that shortly. And currently I'm leaving, leading Black Sky Society and we are, let's say, a collective transcendence network working on a research and arts publication uh, events and uh, partnerships with various crypto protocols. At least that's what we are doing today, but we have greater aspirations. So where did this all start? The, you know, my path towards pivoting uh, towards space, it started more strongly in 2016. And that was about eight years. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, let me drink a little water. That was about eight years after I was working as a software product manager, um, I, you know, I, I all, but I always, I always had this, um, this dream about space. It would show up in, you know, poetry I was writing, music I was making, and decided to make a shift. So my plan was, I'm gonna, okay, just start to do this certificate program, and then use that as a way to build up applying to graduate school, maybe get a master's in space systems engineering, perhaps I'll work at SpaceX or something like that. But what ended up happening instead was I met some people through the certificate program and also a NASA space apps hackathon and the internet. And you know, since I had this background in product management, product design, uh, I naturally, um, you know, that, that comes natural to me, like designing interfaces or thinking of, uh, of, a, of a tool like approach to solve this, uh, problem. So whenever I was taking the classes on, you know, space, space systems and space missions, it was always just like, oh, they're, they are all so costly. They're, they're so much money. There are all these ideas, but there, there is not enough money to fund these ideas, but everyone is so passionate about it. And there's this big community. So uh, I started to think, well, how, how about putting my product manager hat to try to solve this problem? And that's when Space Co-op was born, where the, the mission was, we're gonna create a social network. We're gonna crowdfund and crowdsource space missions. And then it was in early 2017, I read an article by Julio Prisco in this call where he called it a decentralized autonomous space agency, which was very much similar to what I was starting to try to design from an interface perspective and you know, doing community building to bring people along with that mission. So I started talking to Julio and, uh, and this is when I started to become very interested in, in cryptocurrency and realizing that Yes, this is this is going to be the comment. This is going to be the glue that is needed to really bring this vision to life. Um, so we converged, and Space Decentral became a part of Space Co-op. Um, so some people might not know what what is a decentralized autonomous organization. I I call it a group organized around a common mission that coordinates through a shared set of rules and norms that are enforced via blockchain code and social consensus. So um, I want to give a little bit of the history of Space Decentral and what happened because, because what happened with Space Decentral and what emerged in the crypto meets space community has led towards uh, a design evolution that I will be presenting later. So basically, you know, while the aspirations of Space Decentral, as uh, Julio put it, were to bootstrap a global distributed decentralized peer-to-peer -peer space agency of the people, by the people, for the people, it was not obvious how to design it from the earliest phases to be that way. We never did actually launch the DAO on the blockchain, but we 
did catalyze a community and we had something that we called the SMAP or the space mission activation process. Uh, alongside that, we also led the coordination of a program called CORAL, which was planned to be a lunar uh, ISRU mission. Uh, so a little bit about the space mission activation process or SMAP was, you know, there was a core team as the space decentral team and we were, you know, publishing blog posts, we were defining this space mission activation process, we got various uh, judges and advisors to help review missions, uh, you know, even uh, Brent Sherwood, who is now a VP of special projects at Blue Origin, you know, we had a, a, a quite a a, a diverse community. Um, there were different people that were, you know, working at Boeing and working on, you know, space decentral as a side project. You know, they were in the industry or they were, you know, studying space architecture in the university. But anyhow, um, so there was a space mission activation process, and the idea was okay, people. Uh, post ideas on the forum, they discuss them, they form teams, uh, these become more advanced uh, proposals, they get feedback and review. Um, then there's a filtering process, a, a voting process. Um, and then so in, in parallel to this, it's like there's a there are the space, there's a space mission proposal process that's happening. But then there are other uh, other projects or tasks. And we were using GitHub at the moment because this was our way of being yes. an open source space agency. So it's like, you know, people can work on tasks. They earn these effort points for working on tasks. They get voting shares. So, you know, we started just design, de, 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 defining these different mechanisms. We didn't fully put all of them into place, but, you know, this was some of the, the vision there. And then as far as the, the mission activation vote would be like, okay, you know, there's a voting process, we announce the mission, and then it's it then it gets a project plan created and there are tasks and it can be crowdsourced. And at this point, you also need to raise the funding for the missions because you can't just rely on volunteer labor alone. Um, so, so yeah, there was this community that was building around the process, uh, the project. There were a lot of people that were excited. Um, and, and then around that time, there were other, I would say, decentralized space agency visions emerging. Consensus, which is a really big uh, company in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, which is led by Joe Lubin, one of the early investors in Ethereum who, you know, I, he might be considered a billionaire or something like that. Um, so consensus decided they also wanted to create a decentralized space agency. There was actually a contributor who was part of the space decentral community that later went and was working on consensus's uh, decentralized space program. And the consensus uh, acquired planetary resources, the asteroid mining company. Um, and then and then uh, uh, the other project that was happening around the same time was a uh, space chain, which was backed by Tim Draper. So now, you know, this is around like 2008 or so there's like all now there's like all everyone's like, yes, we're going to create a decentralized space agency. We're going to decentralize space. Um, I would say all all three of of the, those early projects, we we were not really successful in the uh, in in the the full vision of creating this peer to peer decentralized space program, um, and um, and what 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 I've been thinking about lately is, hey, you know, there was this there was this vision back then, and it became this viral thing. I really do think that Julio started it, and then it started to become this virus. But instead of everyone's saying this is an amazing vision let's let's figure out how to do this it became more of this like competitive thing where everyone was like we're going to create the first decentralized space agency you know we're going to do it first so it, it became like this uh sort of like just like this this competition instead of what we actually need to make this happen is is uh creating more of a confederation so um so so i want to you know, transition a bit more towards that. It's like, you know, so what are the properties that we need to take into account from a system design perspective to increase the chances of a united confederation of cosmos existing, as opposed to everyone saying, oh, it'd be so cool to just decentralize space and be the leader of that, you know, for us to actually do it, we need to create a, like a multi-leader uh, coalition. So this is a rough, you know, just random out there diagram, but it's like you sort of start from the bottom up, you, you recognize that there will be this emergence, there will be other people that want to do this, that want to be a part of this. 
um, does, you know, des design the system to allow for a multi-leader coalition truly. Um, and for, 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 for what, for how I think this can actually work for how people can collaborate in a coalition you know you have to be binded by something a bit more than just the pursuit or glory of uh of like yes we're going to create a decentralized space agency but it has to be something like more transcendent um for why we are doing this you know there has to be some 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 something that will allow us to overcome you know our differences and collaborate for example so um so I'm going to talk about a proposal for what that process is. Sorry, uh, one before second. Before I get there. Um, uh -huh. Julio, your, your mic is hot, Julio. Amy. Your, your mic was on. Hello? OK. Um, all right. So, um, so uh, the process that I'm going to talk about is called psycho destiny. But before I just describe psycho des destiny, I'm going to explain psycho history because it's sort of inspired by that. So in Asimov's foundation, psycho has history blends uh, history, sociology and statistical analysis to basically predict the collective behavior of large groups of people and try to now that you you know sort of know the future can try to manipulate it so a potential dystopian outcome doesn't happen right so it's a it's a reactive uh it's a reactive um form of uh something science or what have you um so what black sky is, is trying to introduce instead is psycho destiny as a countervailing concept to psycho history uh, so rather than anticipating like societal tendencies, dystopian outcomes and trying to prevent them, um, what we are saying is, uh, you know, as, as individuals or as organizations or as societies or collectives, you know, we we have these we have these dreams of the future. We 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 know the future that we want to be a part of. Um, and if we can more clearly define those and if we can more clearly connect those, perhaps we can inspire each other, lift each other up and create um, what I'm calling a communal dream machine. Uh, so I'm going to go through this process a little bit, but basically um, bas the, the idea starts around like, you know, first setting small goals for psychodestined futures and then allow them to build upon each other and serve as the foundation to realize greater goals because, you know, you can't start off with we're going to Mars today, but, you know, what, what can we, what can we do today and how can we create this network of of uh, psycho destinies. Uh, so, um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through a slightly, it's a very uh, speculative exercise. Uh, these, these stories, these numbers, I have not backed them with actual math and calculations and precision. It's very, it's, it's still loose right now, you know, but this, this but it can get better, you know, so, but I'm just going to present an initial template um and hopefully it can get better as far as a, a projection or prediction so so the year 2023 black sky unveils psycho destiny and presents our vision for a future at this point in time say we're about 20 people and you know we might not even have a treasury of 200,000 a year but based on the the labor or the sweat equity or something like that you know that's about our our capacity at the moment as a as a society so what it, what is black sky society what are what are we all about you know black sky is, as a society we have six core values it's transcendence resilience power transparency life valued exponentially environmental consciousness and compassion um and how we uh, you know, those, so those are values. Those are some common human uh, principles that bind us. But uh, we have we have six different topics, uh, you know, which are like our research topics that we're trying to bring to life. I'm not going to go into detail and explain them in this presentation. Um, the one that is a full in, that that is of interest towards this interstellar ecology more is the cosmic discovery topic. But the other uh six topics it's a post web which has to do with this technological infrastructure which might relate to the crypto components the private 
uh, the privacy components, you know, the, the software that binds us, ensuring that it is sovereign and, and enables freedom. Um, and there is, is network societies. So that's like the, the tools that we're going to build on top of the post web infrastructure. Those will be sort of the, the glue that you need to create a network ecology or an in, interstellar ecology. Psychic evolution has more to do with the unknowns of our mind and a research project that is trying to expand the limits and test the limits of our mind and uh, metaphysics. Um, quantum superintelligence is just recognizing that if you do not have quantum or AI uh, as a core component of your society, you will likely be left behind. While we do, while we, while we are not prioritizing that today, because these are all big six different like huge topics, you know, it's it is in our uh, I would say charter as a society as a, an important. Um, foundation where we will need a an R and D department there, and then uh, planetary symbiosis, which which has to, it's it's more the down to earth one, and this is how you can connect, for example, cosmic discovery, planetary symbiosis, because you know in starting space decentral, actually a lot of people were always so critical about like oh like you have to tell me why you know like like it was just like explained in the last presentation, but why space, why this, why that by actually having earth as a topic of our society alongside space there is no there is no why it's like we care about multiple things you know cosmic discovery is one thing but so is our home planet you know so this is uh is making it you know the society and the vision around the society more holistic while including space as a program not the only thing we are doing but you know it's a it's 16% along with the other topics. So with this now, um, now what's what what can happen? What can emerge? You know, this is this is a dream what, of what can ideally emerge is by the year um, 2024, you know, we have Black Sky Society, but ideally, maybe there are five other psychodestined societies or more that want to join us on the cosmic discovery topic. Maybe there is some overlap on some of the other topics too, but we are saying like, you know, this topic is, is interesting to us as a society, but we do not want to own it. We recognize it as a very large thing and we are going to need a coalition. Uh, so we find five other, at least five other um, societies or organizations that are aligned and we form this coalition, you know? So maybe at this point we have about a hundred people, something like that, maybe our capacity or, or our revenue, it's about like a million a year. Um, so these connect, these collective energies are starting to flow towards actualizing a United Co Confederation Cosmos, but we're still, you know, it's still the early years. Um, so what happens next? Um, in the year 2025, we we announced Starship Destiny One. It's the first human lunar mission of the Psycho Destiny Confederation, where 50 members uh, are selected through a lottery process for space travel, and this commences the fundraising process for the Confederation. So we have seen um, we have actually seen this uh, this lottery process actually work today in the or in the last year, there was a, a project in the crypto community called MoonDAO, where they raised a few million uh, lotterying a Blue Origin flight. Um, and I think whenever crypto, it was like maybe five or six million or something like that. So that mechanism, it has worked for raising millions of dollars for a sort of crypto community. But how do we take that to the next level? You know, because to actually create a decentralized space program, we all know that to, to do anything real and impactful, you are going to need billions of dollars a year. You have to start to exceed the budget of NASA, which is 20 billion a year. So the purpose of this confederation is you need to, we need to increase our population. You know, we're at 1000 people. We just have to keep increasing it. But what you do as part of like this process of increasing it is everyone is part of a lottery process to actually be able to travel to space, even though they might not otherwise be able to afford that ticket. Um, so the, the chances of winning a, a seat will be quite low, but it's sort of through this participation process that we can actually even decentralize access to space. So 
so let's say now it's also the year 2026. And let, let me explain what else is happening through this network because so now it's growing. Let's say it's about 10,000 people and they're they're putting in different amounts of money. Some people are putting in about 100,000 a year, but other people are at the higher tier, about $10,000 a year. Um, and what is being funded with that money, it's not only, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not only raising the money to purchase this Starship Destiny flight, you know, it's like for Starship Destiny to happen, like the, the, it, it needs to go much, much higher, right? But what this network can be doing is funding other projects, um, funding other space missions that are aligned with these different societies. And, um, and th these projects can also have tokens that are created. You know, the 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 security laws of today will will, will say like, oh, you can't just uh, just like do these ICOs and crowdfund and give people tokens back. Um, but I think we need to figure out how to actually change those security laws, where it's like, hey, if someone is putting in a hundred or ten thousand a year. They are not risking that much. Why, why shouldn't they be able to own a percentage of these technologies that the network is, is funding to actually potentially build up, um, you know, just like a new, like you're creating a new currency and it's being backed by, by these assets that are, that are backing like, you know, advanced research, advanced engineering. So this is, this is the direction that this, this ecology needs to ideally move in for the incentive structure to work. So it's not just, oh, you're putting in your money and you were winning a, a chance to go to space. You're actually even potentially securing the future of yourself, the future of your children. Um, so that is, you know, year 2026. Hopefully we start to figure out how these tokens can more easily flow back without it being something the government considers illegal. Um, so, and then 2033. Um, so that is when Starship Destiny is launched. Um, new secondary schools are also starting to pop up worldwide where space expansion and cosmic destiny is a core aspect of the curriculum. And as far as um, how, do, how do we select the crew from, from, you know, let's say we have a million people in our society, uh, how, how are the 50 people selected for who can get that seat? And part of this relates to the, the confederation. Um, so each, each of the organizations, they will be sort of like you'll, you, you can track the, the referrals, like the, there's, a, there's a bit of like an affiliate program and the number of seats that a, an organization has on the mission is like proportional to the sort of like marketing effort that that organization did. So, so there is a bit of a game. There, there are some competitive dynamics of the organizations in the network, but it's also cooperative because you're, you're doing a global crowdfund together. You know, you're strengthening, uh, you're strengthening the, the mission and the message by combining together versus just trying to do this separately. Uh, so then um, let's fast forward to, to 2043. Now we have, you know, we're, you know, this network, it's doing these Starship Destiny missions. It's one of the things it's doing, like I said, it's not the only thing. It's also funding uh, space technologies. It's like thinking of maybe space elevators or what have you, but there's, there's all sorts of stuff going on. I don't really know, but I'm, you know, just telling the story a little bit. So it's 2043, Starship 24 is announced. That's the first Mars mission. Um, and, it, you know, they're also selected through a similar process. Um, and at this point, you know, ideally it's about 20 years from now, perhaps we actually have a, a virtual, uh, virtual nation of sorts. It's like 111 million people and uh, we've, they have, we have 30, 30 billion going towards our, our, our space program or our, uh, our advanced sciences. So, um, so this is a potential uh, possibility, you know, this, this could potentially happen. Why not? It's about 1% of the world. Um, and then a hundred years from now, uh, you know, I'm just really, really fast forwarding through time here. But uh, but if you have this this network of people or this confederation, and we are all also just these uh, these uh, cosmos, we we are we are all interested in the stars. We are all interested in expansion. We know that that to actually open up space to as many people as possible, it's like faster than light teleportation. That's that's so important, you know. Otherwise, it's like we have to we have to figure out how to 
make the the energy costs of space travel it's or it's either faster than light teleportation or mind uploading right so um so yeah hopefully by the year 2123 it's more like you know this is so common and uh, i mean i think if we had world peace uh, we'd probably already be um be working on all of this but that can also in some sense be a way to create this society where you start the this society or this network on a platform of peace you know where 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 to us space travel um space travel and space expansion we know that if we had peace we would be uh exploring the stars so if we start a society where we say what if what if we believe peace is possible and um and we try to you know do these demonstration missions of people coming together uh sending you know these international uh convoys to space that 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 is actually something that's not a nationalistic pursuit perhaps that is what the world also needs to see to believe that that um that peace is possible and perhaps that will accelerate um this uh this mission or this uh this vision so you know that that's my that's my talk i know I, I went through time really fast and i just threw a bunch of random numbers there and uh dreamed up a bunch of things that i i hope can actually happen and um gonna be working on this and make it making it more more actionable. So yeah, I'm Stellar Magnet, part of Black Sky Society. And uh, if you want to find out more information, go to our website, still needs to be updated. But um, yeah, that's my presentation. Well, thank you very much. That was a real roadmap, a really good <laughs> roadmap. I do myself a kind of uh, fear that uh, things uh, will not go that fast. But uh, I hope I'm wrong. And I hope you are right. Now, uh, I think we have time for one question to Steller. And I see that uh, Inara is putting things in the chat. So I'm giving the floor to you, Inara. Thank you so much. First of all, amazing presentation. My mind is blown. I find we have a lot of an alignment. I love your focus on collaboration, bringing people together, creating a confederation. I think what we need to do is build a civilization. So all of these different space orgs and space companies, everyone's working on their piece of it. What I find I'm liking about the DAO communities is they're getting it that we need to build collectively. So I think if we can build a space-based civilization on Earth, and then we're going to get to space so much faster, but we're also going to get there in a way that's better, and we're going to like the results. So I would love to help amplify your mission any way that I can. I'm willing to leverage my networks, my bandwidth, whatever it takes. I've sent you a connection request on LinkedIn, but I just your message is powerful. Thank you for presenting. Oh, that's amazing to hear. I'm going to reach out to you. Thank you. I look forward to talking more. Okay, I'd uh, now like to give the floor to the next speaker, who is Clement Vidal. The floor is yours, Clement. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you see, <clears throat> sorry, can you see the slides correctly? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm excited to, to give a talk today about really the big, big, big picture. Um, so the universal life cycle, I will speak about the noosphere, steady worlds, and immortality. So the biggest problem that uh, intelligent life has to deal with in the long term is the heat death of the universe. And so it's uh, basically the application of the second law of thermodynamics applied to the universe and saying that energy gradients tend to dissipate. And so we, we know that our sun will start its red giant phase and exhaust its fuel already, making Earth inhabitable in one billion year. So yes, the, the logical solution is to go to another star, but uh, the problem is that this other star will also burn its fuel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is so much we can do, even with interstellar travel. Uh, eventually, all stars will run out of fuel. So an intelligent life um, in the universe will have to somehow find a solution. And 
And this is actually the, the greatest problem that we can frame about the universe as a whole is this increase of entropy and disorder uh, and energy gradient dissipating versus also another fundamental dynamics of the universe, which is life, which uses free energy to build complexity. And so which one of these two will win in the long term is, I think, the, the most exciting question that we can ask about the universe. Um, so the idea of cosmological immortality or to achieve immortality in this context, um, there, there, have, there are not many proposed solutions, um, but one of them is to, to hibernate. And it has been proposed by Freeman Dyson in 1979. And the idea is to use um, less and less energy and to hibernate and therefore to, to have an infinite subjective time, even with a, um, with a finite supply of energy. But the problem is that with this scenario is that it doesn't work in an accelerating universe, uh, as conceded by Dyson himself. And uh, there has been also a detailed critique by Cross and Starkman, which led to um, to Dyson refining his argument and saying that the scenario might be saved if we would use analog computers instead of digital computers. Um, because of course, we are speaking about life that is uh, based on, on, on information processing and, and not life as we know it. Um, another great um, scenario is the one of Frank Tipler, which is called the Omega Point Theory. And it has also been developed by David Dutch in his book, The Fabric of a Reality. And what it is, it's um, that the idea is that even in a finite universe, computation and energy supply are, could be unlimited. And uh, ultimately, it, it works with, uh, with uh, the models of, uh, of uh, uh, big crunch of a bouncing universe so that the universe would expand and then contract back and actually this extension uh, expansion and contraction is an energy gradient that intelligent life would be able to to harness unfortunately uh, this assumed uh, assumes a closed universe and we know since 1998 that our universe is actually in an accelerated expansion so I would like to propose, uh, I have proposed another scenario for life to, to continue um, indefinitely, um, which can be called the universal life cycle. So um, bear with me, it's uh, one slide to summarize one whole book. Um, <clears throat> so we start with a, a universe that is fine-tuned for, for life and complexity in general. So this simply means that if the, the, the parameters of the standard physical model and the, the cosmological models had been slightly different, we would not have uh, had complexity of any sort or life that would, could have appeared in our universe, apparently. And so anyway, in our universe, cosmic evolution did, um, did make life emerge. And then uh, life evolves and complexifies up to intelligent life and technology. Then we become aware of the heat death, the ultimate problem of the universe. And, and here the, the idea is to, to simply be inspired by, by biology. So biological organisms uh, die, but they leave a, a progeny, they leave offsprings. And so an intelligent life could set itself the goal to produce a new universe. And how would it do that? It would need certainly a lot of energy. And there is just really one big source of energy that is obvious, which is stars. And so I developed the idea of a steady world, which are extraterrestrials that eat stars. And I will say more about them in a minute. And then the goal is to, to be able to control uh, the black hole density or the space-time structure, because that's, that's how um, 
how uh, space time itself can be could be manipulated presumably and and could give rise to a new universe and then we have the cycle we start again with a fine-tuned universe uh, that has been made by an intelligent life in a previous universe so we've seen the the biggest problem of the universe now i would say um this is the outline of the rest of the talk i will speak about the noosphere steady worlds and some cosmic uh, values to, to make sense of all of this. So we know the, the story of cosmic evolution that starts with the Big Bang and gradually complexifies with stars, galaxies, etc., etc., up to life. <clears throat> but of course, we do live in a very special moment um, of life on Earth, which um, stems from the merging of uh, living things, biology, technology on a global scale. And um, this combination of this um, co-evolution, these synergies, is giving rise to the noosphere. So, <coughs> sorry. so the noosphere can be seen as a, as a new realm, as a, as a new sphere. Um, Beyond, beyond the, the geosphere, so the atmosphere, um, the lithosphere, so just the rocks, the non-living sphere of life, then Earth um, was infused by the biosphere, life is everywhere on Earth, and nowadays we have a, a noosphere, so a sphere of mind or that indeed uh, um, covers the, the, the whole Earth. And, but uh, it's much more actually, the, the noosphere is actually much more than just a sphere of information or the internet. Um, it's it's a, a narrative for, for the future that is at the intersection of three important uh, views of the, of the future. The, um, one is the cosmic view to, to see Earth uh, connected with the, the rest of cosmic evolution. Earth and humanity and technology that to see them as a as in the same sweep uh, in cosmic evolution. The second is um, what I call the green uh, worldview, which includes ideas such as the Gaia theory or or the idea that the the, no, uh, the planet is a kind of super organism or a super organism in formation. And what I call the, the geek or the more technologically oriented view uh, that emphasizes um, technology, the importance of technology to to shape the, the future of the of the planet. And I should add actually also um, the spiritual dimension dimension because um, Taylor de Chardin, who was the, the main proponent of the noosphere, uh, was a spiritual and religious person. Uh, and so, and so it's it's even yeah it can be connected with uh, with um, with religion, and also the interesting thing is that his colleague with whom he had the idea, uh, Vladimir Vernatsky, who was a cosmist, uh, was on his side a totally materialistic atheist person. So really, the noosphere has uh, is a narrative that has uh, the potential to to integrate. Um, a lot of different visions in a in a single narrative that that is meaningful, and I've published a few papers uh, recently about it. Um, and uh, this year uh, is actually the the anniversary of the discovery of the noosphere, and I'm working with a nonprofit, Human Energy, to to um, launch a lot of activities around this uh, hundred hundredth anniversary of the discovery of the noosphere. Okay, so now I would like to to continue to keep the wide focus on, on cosmic evolution and ask what could um, our noosphere or other noospheres become in the far future. And um, one classical framework to just think rather neutrally about the future is to just extrapolate energy use. So presently, humanity is almost a so-called type one civilization on Kardashev scale. It simply means that we are almost able to 
to use all the energy um, uh, available on the planet. But a type two civilization would be able to use the energy output of its home star. And, and I'd like to emphasize also that this view of um, civilizations or generally life using more and more energy, it's, it's not um, just a trend of, of the 60s where there was a lot of new energy use and um, it's more than that. It's really uh, since the origin of life, uh, living systems are able to harness energy gradients more and more efficiently. Um, so, so it's a it's a trend that starts really with the origin of life that that life wants to use free energy to build complexity. Uh, so, what are examples of type two civilizations that would use uh, the, the energy of the star? You probably are, are already thinking about Dyson spheres. So. These are hypothetical constructs that would encircle the whole star and therefore make use of all the energy output of a star. However, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a huge, huge structure, as you can imagine, to encircle a, a big star. And I think it's, um, <clears throat> it overlooks uh, a, very import a very important trend in the development of technology which is the ability to manipulate smaller and smaller scale. So I called it the, the barrel scale. And it simply means that as technology progresses, we are able to go to, to manipulate and to control smaller and smaller scales. So we start with, sorry, we start with um, tools that are more or less at our, our own scale. So, um, um, 10 meters um, and and then we are able to 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 build tools that are smaller and smaller up to micro technology microprocessors then uh, gene editing um, and and so each time we are able to 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 control these smaller and smaller scales, new realms of possibilities are, are unlocked. And, and today uh, we, are, we are in the nanotechnology realm that we are starting really to, to master. But if we look at the, at the scales of the universe and the, the fundamental limits, it's actually much further. It's at 10 uh, to the power minus 35. So uh, in this view, uh, our civilization is just getting started with technology. We still need to develop pico technology, femto technology, ato technology, zeto technology, yocto technology, wokto technology, vocto technology, and down to plank technology. And so the idea that I, I had a few years ago is to actually combine both the energy use. So the Kardashev scale and the, the compression and manipulation of smaller scale or the viral scale. And this led me to the Stalivore hypothesis. So what is the Stalivore hypothesis? It's a reinterpretation of existing known uh, binary stars. So this is a, an illustration of a, a binary star where you have a companion star um, that is being accreted by a compact object that can be a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. And the way I interpret this is basically as a, as a huge metabolic living thing. So the companion star is the energy source. Uh, the interesting thing is that this accretion pattern is uh, irregular. The, the flow can stop and start again which is a fundamental feature of living system that they are able to control their energy flow. If you would eat all the time, or if you would not eat at all, you would die. So we all, all living things need to have the right energy flow to, to be able to survive. And then the system also uh, ejects matter uh, in, term, in, in the form of jets or novas which I interpret as entropy or waste production. And so the big question is whether this um, white dwarf neutron stars or black hole could be alive and eating stars. 
and uh, they, they might be in these three mythological domains. Uh, I like this word because it's always, I find it's always difficult to to sell the idea that life could thrive on other substrates uh, that would be different from life as we know it. So on a white graph, you have nuclear reactions. So here's the idea that the organization of life would not be based on biochemical reactions, but on nuclear reactions. And in the case of neutron stars, uh, it would be another state of matter of a subnuclear, of a subnuclear makeup. And recently, I've, I've worked particularly on um, neutron stars, and I've published a paper about uh, millisecond pulsars uh, that are accelerated by by accreting a, a, on a star, like, like like we saw the picture of Salibor that which that I showed you. And the interesting thing is that if you look at several uh, millisecond pulsars at the same time, you can use them as the analog of GPS satellites. And it's possible to trilateralize your position in the galaxy with an amazing accuracy of 100 meters. Yes, 100 meters accuracy navigation on the galaxy. So I published this paper to ask whether this could be an engineered, engineered system and how we could test it. Also, last week, I presented a, a new ID, which I call the Spider Stellar Engine. And it's uh, reinterpreting the phenomenology of some binary pulsars, um, where, uh, and to interpret it as, a, as a, actually an engine to, to move the pulsars maybe in the right direction for in the right position for a pulsar positioning system or just to, to fetch a, a new star. And the video will be up uh, in a few months. And we should not forget the ultimate stage of Stellivores, which is uh, the black hole stage, which would unlock uh, universe making and therefore a universal cosmos. <clears throat> So what does it all mean for values? Um, I think we need to, to, to entertain very different kinds of values to, to, to have this uh, broad cosmic view. And I would start by saying that uh, the first thing we need to do uh, is to extend our compassion. So a kid typically is self-centered and cares only about itself. As it grows with uh, its family, its group, it can start to care for the group. And then often, ultimately, the, the highest uh, ethical views are, are considered to be the, the ability to care for humanity as a whole, for all humans, even beyond uh, nation states differences or all other human differences. Uh, but we can go further, really we can care for, for the biosphere, for life on Earth as a whole. We can care for, for technology, for the AI minds that are emerging today, and all kinds of new technology, um, uh, te technological ecosystems that, that are arising. And, and then, of course, we can care about life in the universe as a, as a whole, and maybe complexity as, at large. And compassion, once we start to be compassionate about a greater system, we can, we can, we can start to create new identities. So I would just like to take the example of uh, transhumanism and cyborgization. And the, the, the concept of cloth is pretty much integrated in our identities. We all uh, wear clothes, or almost all of humans wear clothes. Um, and technological tools, nowadays we, are, we all have a, a smartphone and there are more and more parts of us. But when we speak about implants, about really interfacing technology with biology, it's often more problematic and it's generally accepted for medical implications. Um, but why is it why is it uh, more more problematic? Um, why is a transhumanist ethics more difficult? 
I believe that the core reason is that it's threatening only if we consider the human form as sacred and fixed. That so these two concepts are important: sacred and fixed. So sacred, we can't change it, and fixed, it doesn't change. So of course, this is uh, this doesn't fit a, a cosmic worldview, where um, and in an evolutionary worldview where. Uh, this kind of evolution with technology is just about creating more diversity, more evolvability, which is part of the of the game since since the very beginning of of the universe. And so, I would contend that the processes and principles of evolution are sacred and not their particular implementation. And also, looking at the even longer term. Uh, nowadays, I think it, we live in a fantastic time where we care for for the Earth as a whole with uh, climate change, with uh, international conflict where everybody uh, feels involved. Uh, but in the future, I, I think we will also care about uh, solar change and the, the fact that our, our, uni our, our, sorry, our sun will change in a, in a red giant. And why not care for the a kind of galactic ecology to maintain uh, the, the stars in, a, in good shape and uh, in, in a good reformation process? And ultimately, an intelligent life would, would care for the universe as a whole and want to make uh, new universes that, are, that, are, that can replicate. And so that would have a, a kind of uh, infinite um, uh, value, uh, ultimate value. So, what kind of ethical frameworks can we can we use? Well, it's very unfortunate that traditional ethical frameworks are actually based on a Newtonian paradigm. So, the Newtonian paradigm uh, is uh, the model of the law of gravitation, the laws of gravitation, and um, where, where there are uh, clear initial conditions, clear rules, and we can predict the, the outcome uh, naturally and easily. And in a way, deontology uh, the, uses the same um, kind of thinking with absolute and timeless rules that allow us to, to guide our actions. It might work in a very a uh, stable environment where everything is very predictable, but it's, I think, totally obsolete today in a very complex and changing world. Also, constitutionalism, including utilitarianism, is deeply problematic because it assumes that uh, we can have a clear deterministic uh, causality, that we can predict the outcomes of everything, that we can predict that this action would lead to uh, more happy people than than this other action, whereas it's extremely hard in our world to, to to predict something like that. And so, in the past few years, I've explored new uh, ethical foundations. One is based on thermodynamics. Uh, it's also called thermoethics or entropy ethics, and it's simply the idea to to make the most of free energy, to, to use free energy to build complexity and not waste uh, energy. Another foundational framework that I explored is a, a computational framework where um, what has intrinsic value uh, are things that required uh, a long computation. Uh, so everything that had uh, that took a long time to to produce has has a has a high intrinsic intrinsic value. Uh, also, I discussed uh, the the tricky issues of evolutionary uh, ethics and developmental uh, ethics, which I think is also very useful. The the idea of development because development uh, provides a, a general direction which the evolutionary uh, principles are uh, uh, don't because they are more adaptive to any any circumstance and most recently um, i'm thinking and working on the the idea to use cybernetics as a 
the new ethical foundation and uh, um and <clears throat> i think it's extremely promising this intersection of cybernetics and ethics and it's compatible with uh, virtue ethics uh, except that we would not try to 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 foster the virtues of just humans but of the virtues of all agents so organizations of all sizes uh, and also ai minds ai agents software uh, robots and that that could have technological virtues and so such a frameworks would also be compatible with pragmatism which is a, a much more flexible way to approach uh, ethical questions so in the summary i proposed uh, the theory that we are part of a universal life cycle we are going through a planetary transformation or major evolutionary transition through the noosphere. Uh, I introduce you to the study of our idea that, namely that some existing binary stars could actually be star eating beings based on a new mythology made of nuclear, subnuclear, or space time structures. And I, I showed you a few cosmic uh, values extending compassion and identities, which I think are necessary, at least for the transition towards the noosphere, where we need to care for AI systems, the planet, the noosphere, and, and the deeper and deeper future. And also with this extending ethical framework, we, we will be ready to find and meet extraterrestrial intelligence, and hopefully, to achieve some kind of cosmological immortality through universe making. And I thank you for your attention. Wow, that was great, Clement. I think uh, we have time for one question. So who is the first who wants to ask something to Clement? I don't see anyone raising hands, so I will make one point. Uh, what I found really interesting in both this talk and in your book was your mention to of new vitologies based on uh, nuclear forces or maybe even uh, gravitational forces and the structure of space time itself. So now I often think about these things. For example, what do you think of the possibility that uh, eventually life uh, forms might uh, migrate as deep down as uh, possible uh, directly to the bare uh, quantum vacuum itself, becoming uh, quantum uh, radiation life forms, which I think is uh, among uh, the most likely and perhaps inevitable long-term evolutionary scenario of the universe. Yes, well, I, I think this would be candidates for a kind of quantum life form, maybe even already white drops because it's it's so compressed and uh, the, the quantum effects need to be taken into, into account to understand what's happening. And why I insist on this compact object is that uh, if your life form suddenly measures uh, a few is near the Planck scale, then it's it's very small. Uh, so if you would just have your diff two different, um, let's say, entities or living things at a very, very small scale, just this distance would be huge for them to interact and to exchange and to, to process anything. So I think the, the size reduction goes with the, the compression. You want your 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 computers or your or your life forms to to also uh, be very near apart and and then it makes it makes everything faster, of course. And and yes, there are studies about uh, what an ultimate computer would be, and and not surprisingly, it would be a a kind of black hole because you have you have all this uh, matter that is compressed and it's very massive so you have a lot of opportunities to to switch um, states of, of 
of matter on to switch bits. Thank you so much. And I see that uh, uh, Max would like you to send his uh, your uh, slides to him. Sure. Uh, please do so, or you can, and uh, if you can also send them to me. And uh, sure. I see that uh, Jose is raising hands and wants to say something. Hello, Jose. Uh, yes, hello. First of all, like uh, Mr. Spock, I want to say to everybody, live long and prosper, my friends. <laughs> live long and prosper. And um, I have a question about the new sphere because I pre pretty much like this idea. And uh, as you said, it is the 100th anniversary. So what kind of activities are you doing for the celebrations? And one final point also about the new sphere. Uh, was it finally only Pierre Telhard de Chardin or also one Soviet scientist uh, who uh, created this idea? Thank you. Okay. Um, so for the 100th anniversary, uh, we are actually running right now uh, a masterclass on, on Zoom that is uh, free. Uh, well, it's too late to join, but we'll probably reconduct the experiment. So there is more than 100 people that are uh, learning the, the science uh, behind the, the noosphere. Uh, and this project is also um, action oriented, project oriented. So at the end of the masterclass, uh, we we hope that small groups would have formed and and try to to contribute in one way um, projects to to that are compatible with the noosphere that that can um, make a positive noosphere hatch. There will be also uh, a conference uh, at the end of the year in the in the Bay Area, probably at UC Berkeley, and and also in Europe. Um, um, and other workshops. I mean, uh, yes, I, I will. I will put in the chat uh, the the link to Human Energy, which is the organization that leads that, and you, you will be able to see more details too. Um, regarding the origin of the Noosphere um, idea, um, it's. Most likely, it, it was in 1923, where um, when Vladimir Vernetsky, so the Russian scientist that you have, have, have in mind, uh, he presented at the Sorbonne in Paris the idea of the biosphere. And, uh, and then Taylor de Chardin and, um, um, and Leroy, a mathematician and colleague of Pierre Taylor de Chardin, they, they went with Vernetsky to, after the seminar to their apartment and then there is a brainstorm about the future and that's where they they came up with the idea of the noosphere uh, as, as an extension of the biosphere as, as something new that would encircle the the, the earth and um yes and it was published in press uh, first by Taylor de chardin in 1925 uh, and then developed in his uh, masterpiece the, the the phenomenon of man, which That's is really which is really a masterpiece indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Clément. Unfortunately, we don't have time to continue this discussion because uh, we have to proceed with the program. And since uh, yours uh, was uh, a very dense philosophical and metaphysical presentation, now perhaps uh, it's time for some. Uh, uh, science fiction diversion, so that uh, I would like to invite uh, Todd Drashner and uh, Trond Nielsen to take the floor. I see that one is coming alive and the other as well. Orion Sarm, the floor is yours. Wonderful. So, Todd, do you have the slides to, to share? Uh, yes, I do. One moment. Wonderful. Uh, do, 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 do. That up. Okay. Wonderful. So welcome to the Orion's Arm Universe Project, a scenario set thousands of years in the far future where civilization spans the stars. 
where godlike ascended intelligences rule vast interstellar empires and lesser factions seek to carve out their own dominions through intrigue and conquest. Um, if you move on, next, next slide. Oh, the future isn't here yet, but don't worry, it will be. Um, so, the, so the Ryan's Arm pro, uh, project. We're gonna we're gonna structure this talk um, today briefly. I'm gonna introduce you to the project. Um, we're very very high level. We're a science fiction project. We've been around for almost getting towards 25 years, 23 years now, 23 and a half years. Um, we're very much uh, based around transhumanist uh, ideas and a lot of other characteristics, which we think will you'll find quite interesting. Uh, but really, the big idea. No, go back. Um, the big idea that we want to um, cover here is a concept that we're calling diverse futures. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is contrast ourselves with um, science fiction settings, which we call single element futures. And Todd will uh, cover that in a little bit. But the, the, the talk is very much structured about this one big idea. And then we have a lot of examples to sort of illustrate that. Um, so we'll get to that in a moment. But first, just to introduce us, uh, I'm Trond, Todd's there as well. We've been working on this project for now for since 2001, 2002, we, we, we both got involved. Um, my role in the project is I sort of am the webmaster technology provider. I basically have built the, the platform on which the project runs and I continue to maintain it and am involved in various conversations related to that. Todd is sort of one of our editors in chief and also our secretary and treasurer and keeps the lights on, so to speak, keeps everything organized. Um, yeah, so if we move on to the next slide, I'll give you some, some high level understanding what Ryan's arm is about. So the first thing to understand about it is it's a shared science fiction setting. By shared, I mean it's maintained and written by a large group of individuals over time. And so consequently, it's not something that represents any one person's particular viewpoint. Uh, it's more of a viewpoint that has been negotiated among many of us over time. We incorporate features such as uh, we're very much far future. Our setting is, is primarily uh, targeted at sort of 10,000 years in the future. Uh, but in order to get to 10,000 years in the future, you need to have an awful lot of history to get you there in the first place. So we have a very um, broad um, future history that uh, takes us out there far. We very much believe in science fiction based on plausible technology extrapolated to its logical ends. Um, so we would fit ourselves primarily in the world of hard science fiction in the sense that we, we, whenever we propose technology, it needs to meet the laws of physics as we understand them. Now, that doesn't mean we don't speculate and, and extrapolate laws that haven't been discovered yet, but there are certain hard and fast things like far, far, faster than light travel, for example, that we exclude. Um, but the key thing about this, though, is the word plausible. If we're going to have technology, it has to be explainable, it has to be understandable. Um, we really care a lot about cultural development. An awful lot of science fiction uh, settings are basically Americans in space, uh, and it's very much modern you know, contemporary institutions in a, in, a, in a far future world with lasers and things, we're, we're not that. We're very much not that. Uh, we have realistic exobiology. Um, and we also take seriously the idea that technology will change us, not just at a social level, but at a hard um, personal level that we will become post-human as part of this. So, so Ryan's Arms are very, very broad setting and includes a lot of interesting ideas like that. Beyond being a science fiction setting, we're not necessarily a setting that is um, being serving just one purpose. Many, many times science fiction settings exist or are created to, for example, serve the backdrop to a popular television science, uh, series such as Star Trek, or perhaps to be the source material for a role-playing game such as Traveller. There, there are many of these, um, many settings out there that have a particular purpose. Orion's Arm serves many of these purposes. It started primarily as a collective writing and a world-building project by people who just wanted to tell stories and explore and design worlds because they enjoyed that. Um, it very quickly became a forum for cutting edge science discussion because once you get a bunch of nerds in the room talking about science fiction, weirdly enough, we start getting into the deep science of these sorts of things. And it's been a great deal of fun for that. Um, it's become a setting for storytelling, scenario building of all sorts, people, everything from short stories. Uh, we've had some people write novels based in the setting. We've had people build and run role playing games in the setting. Uh, it's a universe of big ideas. A lot of us, I think, are involved not just because we like science fiction, but because we like to explore the possibilities that science fiction gives us as a means of speculating about the future, ranging from the, I will say, mundane speculation of, you know, exactly how is science, uh, so, sorry, space travel going to work in the next five to 10 years versus all the way through to what is going to, what is the word mind going to mean to us in five or 6,000 years, all, all of these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, Todd, Todd loves to like, put this one in here. We're a bunch of semi-sane sentients having fun together, which is basically really 
the root of this organization. We're a bunch of nerds. We like having fun. We like writing. We like discussing ideas. And we have had the immense privilege of sharing that with many other people. And the last key um, thing about OAA is that we're open and non-commercial. Our content is all available on a, under a Creative Commons license. Um, and consequently, we have found that our material has been absorbed into many other places. We re regularly find it as part of other people's settings, and that's fine because that's part of the license. So that's what it is, a little bit of history and a little bit of uh, just high-level overview of structure. Um, Ryan's Arm has been around since about June 2000. Um, it was originally founded by four folks here, um, uh, Alan Kaslov, Donna Hersikorn, Bern Halford, and Anders Sandberg. Um, you may know Anders as being part of the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. Um, Alan kaslov has been a enthusiastic compiler of esoteric and interesting materials on the internet um, since the late late 90s and has been he's no longer involved in the project but he's been off doing all sorts of other interesting uh, things since around 2003 though we've we've largely been managed by a community board um, which at various times has had about 10 people involved in sort of just maintaining the organization and keeping things going and we've been as I say around for about 23 years we have currently got about 20 contributors currently actively working on and writing um, things for the setting. We have about 500 participants with some level of activeness on our forum and our Discord. So there's quite a lot of constant, there's constant flow of people doing things in the in the space, which is great. Um, and the whole thing's built around an interactive encyclopedia that we have um, not so uh, not so modestly called the Encyclopedia Galactica because it's uh, it's, a, it's a great name. Um, it's it's a graph based uh, encyclopedia. Basically, it's lots and lots of articles and topics all linked together very tightly with a, with a lot of uh, crossover. Uh, there's about 5,500 nodes, which by that we mean an article in it, making up about three and a half million words of material. Um, so I like to describe this as being we are about five Bibles, or uh, if you prefer Lord of the Rings, we are about eight of those. Um, so we're a fairly large body of work. And the reason, part of the reason that for that is that our material is possibly a bit more detailed than is reasonable. And by that, we, I mean, mostly just that we like to sort of get into the weeds on things. We're not going to propose, hey, there's a planet and it's got these, these aliens on it and to do that in a paragraph. Most of our, most of our worlds, most of our settings, most of our concepts are fleshed out in a great deal of detail. So moving on. So this is just a mission thing that, that I think is helpful for understanding why we're doing all this and also maybe to put into context some of the reasons why, how we've ended up thinking about things the way, the way we have. So we, we have this, this mission. I'm not going to read, read this all out to you because you've got eyes. I'm going to highlight a couple of uh, key points. First one, we're about inspiration. We're not necessarily trying to tell people that this is what that future will be. And if you want to be in our setting, you must be 100% compliant with everything. If you're going to write something that is published within our setting using our name, then we want it to be reasonably uh, canon, so to speak. But really, a large part of what goes on in the community is people being inspired and developing things for their own settings, using ideas from here and then contributing back to it. So we're, we're, we're a lot more about insp inspiring that community than we are about sort of um, defining a one true way things have to be though you know because of course we do have to maintain internal consistency for ourselves um we hear a lot about things being plausible uh they have to be internally consistent they have to abide by accepted facts and theories and we want to extend that not just from everyone talks about physics and when they when they talk about science fiction is you know your your science fiction setting it breaks the laws of physics very very rarely do people talk about how your science fiction law uh, setting breaks sort of the the assumptions and laws of how biology functions or how society functions and so we really want something want to build something that is as consistent with our current understanding of these things as possible and that as you can imagine does mean that sometimes we have to revise things um and this is up to me a big part of why the setting is so much fun we embrace a lot of ideas that are speculative but that are plausible and that we think are you know likely in some context maybe not next year maybe not in 100 years but that, that seem plausible given what's out there so obviously we, we you know there's many many classic uh transhumanist sort of tropes or, or uh, science fiction tropes here that we think are yep these seem they don't break the laws they seem likely they seem really interesting and so we include them there's a couple of other things though that we we don't really uh, do for example simple faster than light travel the idea that i can hop on a spaceship and just be at the next planet in a few hours a la star trek um the idea of simplistic humanoid aliens where basically every sentient being in the universe is a uh, is a white american with uh, latex glued to their face um again star trek uh, and to be clear i'm giving star trek a hard time but I, of course i love it okay how can you not um, but then the last uh, challenge here is trying to avoid this idea of contemporary societies and cultures in space. Uh, space travel will change us. 
drastically. The things that we need to do to get to the point that we can travel uh, across interstellar distances will change us. And so that means that we really need to think about how what those changes will be and how will that result in things evolving very differently. So these are all ideas that are baked into the settings that are, are common pieces of conversation within the group. And so from this, we, we extrapolate as much as possible to really push the boundaries. Um, one, of, one of those wonderful quotes, you, you can't do these things without a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, but the only way to explore the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And that's very much uh, a, a key theme uh, for us. And so our goal then is to create this ever evolving universe in a way that is interesting, inspiring and provocative. We really want to make people think and that means poking them a little bit. Next slide, I think that might be time for me to hand things off. Oh no, some, some ground rules. So, so these are, I will say that the, the sort of the ground rules for the setting, pretty much everything else is free game. But first off, things don't matter, doesn't travel faster than light. We haven't necessarily defined that on in terms of energy, tachyons and the like, but um, certainly matter has, and, and if I got that wrong, Todd will tell me, tell me I'm wrong. Uh, matter and energy conservation is preserved. Um, we do not have any evolved humanoid aliens, mostly because we think they're not that interesting, but also based on extraterrestrial, sorry, extra, um, lo looking at ex ex uh, ex extra solar things, we haven't got any reason to believe that they, they exist at the moment. Um, we take as gospel the idea that technology will change the nature of our social issues, that society, that culture will change over time. Uh, we have a base rule that everything that we include in the setting, even the most fantastic thing, needs to be explained logically somehow. Um, everything needs to fit in. Um, we take again that mind and society will change drastically as technology evolves. And then the last one, which really leads us into the rest of this talk, is the idea that space is vast, time is vast, and innovation is almost infinite. And so consequently, if you start to build a very large science fiction setting, as we have, you have to assume that many, many problems, or almost every every problem is going to have many, many different solutions. And so that leads to a inevitable theme around diversity. There are so many solutions to all the various problems that come up in here. And, and a large part of the rest of this talk is trying to justify, I think, to you why we think that's a really key element of any science fiction setting. Um, so diversity, diversity, diversity. And with that, I'll hand off to Todd, who will get into the idea and some of those examples. You're muted, Todd. Todd, you're muted. Todd. There we go. Just technology issues, I imagine. All right. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we Yay. can. All right. Todd, somehow you've got muted up, ended up muted again. Maybe it's just me that's seen it. Unmute. Thinks I'm unmuted now. I can hear you now, yes. All right. If We'll try this one more time, and if it wants to mute me again, I'll try, and I will hand over to you to um, move slides forward, and I'll talk, because apparently it doesn't like the slides being up for some reason. Oh, good. Yeah, give one more go. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll share. All right. Yeah, no, it seems to mute you whenever the slides get shared. So I'll just go ahead and, and share, my, share them from my end. OK, right, thank you. Oh, the issue is probably that Zoom mutes you when you press space. So if you pass slides uh, using space, it, and if your Zoom window is open, then it would mute you. Hmm. I'll go ahead and do this. Do the do the share though, just to make anyway. it a little easier, since I know it works. Here we have share. Oh, that's the wrong slide though. Let's uh, go to the correct one. Uh, this is where you want to start here, Todd. Yes, please. Yep. Wonderful. All right. Mm -hmm. You hit advance one more time because there should be more animation coming in. There we go. Some materials. 
There we go. Yay. All right. Um, so anyway, so you a lot, often in fiction, not always, but often, and sometimes also in papers written about the future, um, there's a big focus on one particular element. And it may be, for example, that everyone uploads, that if you have a story about uploading, that's going to be, or where uploading exists, that's the primary piece of the story. Everything talks around that element. Um, if there's a paper about uploading or what uploading, what our society might look like when, if and when uploading becomes possible, it's going to focus on that. Similarly, if you have, you're talking about terraforming, you'll have fictional settings where everything is terraformed and almost, you know, there may be space stations around, but otherwise everyone is terraforming. If you have a paper about terraforming, logically, you're going to talk about terraforming and so on. And there are good reasons for this. Um, in many cases, uh, a big one being in fiction or writing a paper, there's deadlines, there's only so much con you know, room that you have for content. And so it makes sense to focus on your central theme. However, in reality, that the future is probably going to be a lot more um, complicated and with a lot of things going on at once. Uh, next slide, please. So what you're going to have is a lot of people, especially as we get into the far future and the sort of future that we've been discussing here today, you're going to have a lot of populations living in a lot of different places, trying doing a lot of different things and probably coming up with solutions that work for them in their local situation that don't match what people in, for example, the next star system over or even the next world habitat orbit over see as the correct solution or the one that they want to perform. Um, so you're going to have a gigantic amount of diversity in that future as we see civilization expanding out across the stars, if not further. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and in Orion's arm, uh, as Trond indicated, we try to look at what that kind of future might look like and what happens when all of these different elements all come together and are all operating at the same time, uh, in a sense, you know, all at once. Next slide, please. So just to give you some vital statistics for what this kind of um, type of speculation uh, results in, uh, as Tron mentioned, the time the OA setting has over 10,000 years of history. Um, we actually begin the timeline in a sense at uh, the year zero for us is the is today, the, the anniversary or the date of the first landing on the moon. Uh, that is, we use what is called the tranquility calendar, because uh, it's kind of fun, honestly. This is a real world thing that someone created. It's a calendar that starts from the moon landing and moves forward. Um, and so we have the future in OA goes out to about the year 10,600 after tranquility, AT. There are approximately 2 billion major locations within the setting. About a billion of those are stars of all types, not sun like stars, all stars. Um, it, the area of space that humanity and its descendants and other creations have explored uh, is about 16,000 light years across, roughly. Um, the other billion of that two billion are other things besides solar systems or star systems. That's everything from brown dwarfs out in deep space, uh, deep space gas giants and other planets, nebulae, uh, bot globules, and also in some cases, just very large drifting habitats or spacecraft that move take a very long time to travel between stars and are essentially entirely enclosed civilizations in themselves. They swing by a star, use it for resources and go on their merry way somewhere else. So there are lots and lots and lots of places. And that's before we even get down that every one of these places of those major locations are filled with minor locations. They have planets, moons, asteroids, space habitats, towns, cities, individual homes. So the actual number is vastly larger than 2 billion, which is why I said it's approximate, but you get the idea. Uh, the setting has a population that we've come up with of greater than 300 quintillion beings. It actually fluctuates or is depending on how you're setting your standard between 300 and 3000 quintillion beings, most of whom are virtual, are software based, that is to say uh, artificial intelligences, uploads, artificial life simulation products, that kind of thing. Uh, it varies because exactly how you're defining a being or a person varies with different criteria or with what criteria you're using. Out of those 300 to 3,000 quintillion, um, only about 390 quad quadrillion have bodies. Uh, so yes, the, the AIs and the software very much dominate, although most of them are busy doing their own thing and don't worry about 
those with bodies. And out of those 390 quadrillion, only approximately 90 quadrillion are biological as we would normally understand the term. So um, yes, we the robot overlords are all over to be found uh, and they are us. Uh, there are thousands of civilizations within the setting in principle. We don't have literally thousands of different ones written up, although we have quite a few. Um, and in these range anywhere from empires of millions of star systems down to individual things the size of city states or even smaller. Um, and everything in between spread across all of these different locations. Um, in many cases, they will almost live right next to each other, um, like literally the next habitat over. In other cases, they are separated by hundreds or thousands of light years. Many of the major, even the major empires are not, for example, the United States in space or Britain in space. They are something more similar in, in a general way to something like the European Union, where you have a whole bunch of cultures and civilizations that are all kind of working together. They have sort of a, you know, some unified policies or a you know, unified letterhead as it were, but within themselves, they are their own entire civilizations um, that go about and do their own things internally. And then finally, just as an interesting vital statistic that I'll get into a bit more, there is not one singularity in the setting, but there have been six. Um, and they are not, a, and we'll get into that in a, in a bit further down the line. And next slide, please. And first thing to kind of talk about just the sheer diversity of the setting that, and the scale of the setting that uh, Tron mentioned at the start is we're gonna talk about habitats, uh, which you see some images here. And uh, next slide, please. We'll get into the details a bit more. And these are just representative examples. Uh, there are many, many more besides this, but uh, these are some of the habitats found in the system as far as in the setting, as far as space habitats. Uh, we have things Bishop rings, if you're familiar with those, these are um, space habitats built based around car carbon nanofiber being able to be mass produced. Uh, they run anything up to a couple thousand kilometers in diameter, um, about the same surface land area as India, I believe. Um, you have what we call biohabitats. These are uh, habitats that are maybe produced by biological technology. So they, instead of being uh, assembled per se, they are grown in some similar to say trees or to something like a coral reef or spider web and being assembled uh, that way. Um, in, uh, and then from those, actually, if you look down toward the bottom, you see dice and trees, which are a subset of biohabitats. Uh, these are actually uh, an idea that Freeman Dyson came up with where they are genetically engineered organisms that are seeded onto comets and grow into a space habitat that's maybe 100 kilometers across. Uh, it is a tree or a set of trees, and they have spaces inside their trunks and branches that have um, biospheres that presumably creatures like us, human beings or other entities can live in, uh, sort of a living space habitat. There are microgravity space habitats. They, uh, not everything spins for gravity. Uh, large numbers of people are engineered, whether through genetic engineering or therapies or through cybernetic enhancements to find microgravity perfectly, perfectly comfortable indefinitely. And they build habitats accordingly that have no particular, feel no particular need for a sense of up or down or gravity. Uh, whoops, oh, there we go. Um, and you also see in the lower left corner, an ex uh, one example of that, a free sphere, which is basically a large uh, air-filled sphere about anywhere from 100 to some yeah, thousands of kilometers across. Pardon? Hey, how are you? I'll keep it on. Uh, I'm in the office right now. Grant, um, your, your microphone's hot. Oh, there we go. Um, so they are one example, and they have a, a free fall uh, gen uh, engineered, a biosphere engineered for free fall inside them. Um, often they do tend to be smaller because people like the view. Uh, we have things like O'Neill cylinders, which are probably pretty familiar to everyone here. They come in as well as things like Stanford Tori, Bernal Spears, the smaller habitats, although uh, some of those also come in very large sizes, again, through use of carbon nanofiber, uh, up to, uh, if you're familiar with Tom McIndry's uh, work on habitats that using diamondoid or carbon fiber, they run to hundreds or thousands of kilometers long. Uh, disc worlds are sort of like bishop rings, except instead of one level, um, they can come in smaller sizes as well. Instead of one habitat level as a spinning ring, they actually have multiple levels fill and are filled in and can in, have, in fact have internal chambers with different environments within them. Flat earth habitats are sort of 
if you're in the process of building your habitat slowly and you're not enclosing it in all at once, or you just like having a, you know, some large open air spaces or just, you know, not a full cylinder, you wanna see the stars, uh, that kind of thing. So you have all these and many, many more. These are just some of the habitats, civilizations in different places and at different times, depending as their capabilities have increased, build different things. Uh, next slide, please. And sort of in the same vein, um, although uh, our standard is that the vast majority of the population does live in space habitats, um, a, a, we'll say a minority of the population, comparatively speaking, uh, does use planetary surfaces to one degree or another. Um, and you have, a, you know, so you have everything from terraforming that I'm sure we are all familiar with. Note, by the way, in a way, terraforming doesn't necessarily mean an environment that people like you or I could live in comfortably uh, because there are plenty of um, human descent, human derived beings who have engineered themselves to live in other environments. So their idea of what is a comfortable planet to, to you know, to quote unquote terraform wouldn't necessarily be ours. Um, you have, for example, bubble habs where that uh, live in uh, gas giant on the upper atmosphere of gas giants or Venus like worlds. They're sort of a floating arcology um, or city state. Uh, sometimes there's whole uh, groups of them that that operate together as a larger community. Um, you have some of the, the two bottom ones, super mundane, actually the three bottom, uh, super mundane habitats, artificial planets, and space fountains. These are using dynamic compression members, circulating streams of, or ribbons of particles moving at high speed and using centrifugal force to support against gravity. Um, they may use the two on the, the artificial planets and super mundane um, will, often uh, be built around an underbody like a gas giant or a black hole to provide gravity and so on and so forth. And next slide, please. Okay. Uh, you also have mega scale habitats of various sorts. These can be roughly classified as from about 100,000 kilometers across up to planetary orbits in size. Um, there are of course Dyson spheres in multiple flavors uh, multiple designs, and matryoshka brains, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with. Um, and I won't get into all the details of these. Um, you know, certainly you can reach out to us at, uh, or come to, come to the site. We have lo large articles on all of these, so come check it out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also have a huge number of different types of beings living in the setting, uh, as we call them sophants. These are possessed of um, self-awareness, problem-solving ability, etc. It's the term in setting that is used for that, uh, or used for these beings. And next slide, please. Um, these in turn break down into some major groups. You have what we call bions or in beings who are based on bio biology. Uh, you have provolves. These are basically animals that have been re-engineered over time into tool using, problem solving, self-aware beings of various kinds. Uh, there are groups within the setting that essentially treat that as a religion. Um, that to make as many things possible, a lot, you know, self-aware and tool using as possible up to and including inert matter. Um, so the provolves, there are literally hundreds of thousands of species from Earth alone that have been provolved as well as the, um, some alien planets that have been found uh, with their own biospheres, that's happened there as well. Uh, tweaks have been engineered to live in different environments, uh, most of which would, we would find uncomfortable at best and deadly at worst, people like us. Uh, you have cyborgs, which in some sense, most people are um, in some of the implants and such that they have, but the cyborgs kind of as a lifestyle choice, push it even further. Um, and what we call reants, which are sort of combinations of different genetic um, codes with hu humans and animals or an you know, what we, different species creating yet new species. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also have what we call VEX and virtuals. VEX are um, sentient or softened robots uh, in honor of Hans Moravec and his work. Um, these come again, as with everything in a huge variety of forms, you can kind of see on the, the left and bottom, uh, everything from uh, robot bushes to balloons uh, to cybernetic worms or worm-like forms. And then the virtuals are software-based beings, which there are a titanic number of them, as we said. And some of them appear somewhat human, and some of them are so completely inhuman uh, that they have virtually nothing in common with us. Um, 
you know, and they are kind of off busy doing their own thing and don't care about in, the people with bodies very much. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we do have some aliens in the setting or xenosophants as we call them. Um, as Tron mentioned, one of our ground rules is no humanoid aliens. Um, so we have creatures, let's see, we have creatures who live in Venus-like environments. We have creatures who are arboreal and don't ever come down to the ground, aquatic. Um, aliens who live on an environment more similar to Titan than anything else. And they would find, they would literally boil to death if they were exposed to, you know, what we consider a freezing cold day. And there have also been alien artifacts found um, of various sorts, often megastructures, including some Dyson spheres. Uh, the Fermi paradox is alive and well in OA because although we have encountered various, some alien races, although not that many, and we see others in other galaxies, we also keep finding ruins all over the place and evidence that other races in the past have disappeared and we, nobody really quite knows why. So that's one of the mysteries in the setting. Uh, next slide, please. And within the setting, I mentioned there are six singularities. Um, the big thing that OA does mostly on, as from editorially as a way to keep civilization around long enough to play, play with is a singularity rather than being a civilization wide event that sucks up all of civilization and we all you know, disappear to whatever that is, is actually more of an individual event. Um, an individual being or sometimes a small group of beings will augment themselves, their minds and their thinkings to such a degree in most cases, they bog down, they hit a limit on how far they can go, but every now and again, um, they figure out a way to jump up to a different form of consciousness or mind that is to, for example, the human experience as human experience in our possession of self-awareness is to say a blade of grass. Uh, it involves new ways of thinking, new ways of, of processing information and sometimes mental capabilities that we can't even comprehend. And this has happened six times, not to just six different beings, but they say the beings who went through the first time then figured about, figured out after some centuries of effort, yet another level. And then those in turn figured out another level and it gets harder and harder each time. So by the time you get up to the sixth singularity, there are only about three dozen such beings pretty much running everything, possibly as more of a reflex than anything else compared to whatever they consciously spend their time on. Uh, and they essentially rule the civilization and everyone else sort of has to work around them or do, with, do as they say to one degree or another. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one moment, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I ask mm -hmm. you to wrap it up and finish yes. in two minutes Almost done. because we must press on. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So this just illustrative here are the, as I said, there are the six singularities. Um, I would say go to the website to see what each of them do with their time or can do. And then finally, uh, last slide. And just really quick, these are sort of the core technologies that we spend a lot of time examining the setting. There is nanotechnology in both biological and non-biological flavors. Biotechnology is kind of a whole thing in itself. There are entire civilizations that consider flesh and blood to be superior to silicon and diamond, as it were, and try to build as much as they can using that. Um, the use of magnetic monopoles um, for total matter to energy conversion. So fusion is kind of considered an amusing little thing. When you don't want a lot of power, if you really want to do it right, you say convert an entire star 100% to energy and use that energy for something. Um, Artificial intelligence and robotics and computation is everywhere, uh, sometimes to the point where it replaces all microbial life in a planetary biosphere. Uh, it's in the walls, it's in your clothes, it's in you, it's everywhere. Virtual reality, um, there are a vast number of virtual worlds in existence. They are generally considered to be real places with people living in them. Uh, some of them are so abstract that we would not be able, as we are now, navigate them at all. Uh, and finally, metric engineering. This is also known as space-time engineering. These are things like wormholes, um, a variation on the LQBRE warp drive. It is not faster than light. As we said, we don't have faster than light. That's explained in the EG. And some various other things up to and including um, the highest level of singularity are rumored to be able to create whole new universes for various purposes. So, and that is our last slide. Uh, just a really quick overview. One more slide, actually, uh, Tron, if you'll advance it. Just any questions and there is our uh, web address. As I said, please go out. Um, we have a vast amount of information on all these things there and lots of other fun stuff. So please go out and explore.
Yeah. Also worth noting, if you're interested in getting involved, um, the website has obviously access to the forum um, and all the material, but you can also join our Discord if you just want to have conversations about these things. We have a very active community there of people who would love to geek out about this sort of thing with you. Thank you very much to both. I really love Ryan Sarma. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but uh, you know, I'd like to recommend to everyone to read the, the only full length book novel that I know, uh, which is set in the Orion Sarm universe, which is called Betrayals by Steve Bowers. Um, is uh, really one of my favorite science fiction books. Go and look for it. Huh? And uh, thank you very much again. I would uh, now <clears throat> like to give the floor to Max. Floor is yours, Max. Studio. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are. Uh, yesterday, I checked out the video of the Apollo 11 launch and landing. Uh, I presume everybody's done that, but possibly not. Especially if you're alive at the time, I found that uh, watching that again was extremely emotional experience. I've, mm. uh, a little embarrassing to say, but I cried watching that again. Uh, I was five years old when, the, when that happened. Um, I think it was, uh, I think the moon landing itself was in the early hours of the morning, like three in the morning in England. Uh, and even though I was at that age, I was allowed to stay up and sit there on the floor and watch this thing, which was incredible and burned itself into my mind forever. Uh, to me, it was a very powerful thing that happened very early in my life and uh, has been there ever since. It's a very core part of my own worldview. So if you haven't watched that recently, uh, I recommend doing so. It was a little odd for me because originally, you know, we only had a black and white television back in 1969, but it actually is in color. So I saw an enhanced version of it, I guess, from what I originally experienced. But that was that was pretty incredible. That that first trip of 218,000 miles, and uh, you know, Neil Armstrong describing stepping onto the moon and the powdery substance, and everybody holding their breath as is this actually going to happen? Um, if you if you remember, he actually touched down with practically zero seconds of fuel left. They were counting down from 30 seconds when you'd have to abort and take off again. And he was down to practically zero and just landed in time. So that was uh, an awfully long time ago. As you said, Julie, it was kind of ridiculously long, over half a century ago that, that happened. And it's taken us an awfully long time to start catching up again and getting back to some kind of progress in space. So I'm not going to give uh, slides here. I'll give your eyes a rest. You can just uh, feast on my beautiful face instead while I say a few things uh, on a philosophical perspective, basically. And I think actually what I'll be saying will lead into uh, Tom's talk, which follows, I think, quite well. So basically, you know, as I've kind of already implied, space to me has been a part of my worldview from as long as I can remember. And uh, I think most of you are familiar with the idea of, of the extropian philosophy, the extropian version of transhumanism. And space was a, very much a part of that. The whole concept of extropy, which was a concept that Tom and I came up with, and Tom actually defined, came up with the actual term itself. Um, and one of the earlier talks talked about entropy, and indeed extropy is kind of the converse of that, not in a technical sense, but a metaphor for increasing energy, uh, possibilities, all the pro-life good things that we, we want. Uh, and obviously space is part of that because we're stuck in this gravity well where you know we're kind of running out of new places to go and do things um as our population expands and our possibilities expand we want some more room and uh, i'll be talking about three main reasons primarily focused on one of them why we need space particularly uh so extropy the idea basically is all about overcoming uh boundaries and constraints so space is one of those but it goes along with other uh, other boundary breaking ideas, such as enhancing human cognitive abilities, enhancing our emotional experiences, um, changing ourselves in various ways, which of course also connects to space very much as other speakers have talked about, because monkeys in space doesn't really work very well. We're going to have to, at the very least, as Christopher talked about, make some modifications in our biology to better resist irradiation and weightlessness and so on. But in the long run, we may quite drastically diverge into you know, subspecies and uh, a whole, whole radiation of different kinds of species more adapted to space and possibly also even upload and go beyond biology at some point. So there's kind of an interconnection between these ideas of space, cognitive, physical, uh, augmentation, enhancement and, and modification. They go together really very well. Uh, and for the historical, historically minded among you, um, you know, we started, Tom and I started x Magazine in 1988, believe it or not, that was almost prehistorical as used to say. Um, but there were some precursors. Um, I think Keith Henson's on, he might know this one, but there was a, a newsletter called Claustrophobia, 
which I read uh, back, back in the 80s, look before x magazine. And it was kind of a proto x It focused on space, um, life extension, and I think cognitive augmentation possibly. So it was, it was kind of a proto x newsletter. Uh, there was also the popular magazine Starlog, and I think more importantly, Future Life back in the 70s, which almost nobody remembers these days, but they had some very interesting articles like by Robert Anton Wilson on immortality. And it was really very extropic in its focus. So that's kind of where I came from. And another connection really between two of the main transhumanist ideas, you know, life extension is obviously central to transhumanism because all the other possibilities are going to take some time to unfold. And if we only have 70 or 80 years, that's not really a lot of time, especially if you're already getting on like uh, some of us, uh, we need to have more, more lifespan to enjoy those possibilities, including space. And of course, space has been particularly frustrating again until very recently, the decades have been going by while well, you know, I, I went through my teens and my 20s and my 30s and my 40s and into my 50s. And what the heck is happening? Why isn't somebody doing something? Well, finally, we're starting to do something. But, you know, I'm in my 60th year now. So I'm going to need to live longer to enjoy this um, or I have to make sure that cryonics works. So when I come back, I can be out there in space and enjoying it. So these two things really go together. And obviously, it's also rather absurd to me to think of uh, living in space but dying at the same age that we do today. That seems pretty absurd that we have those capabilities to explore the universe, but we really don't get to see very much because we die. So I think it's, um, although a lot of space people may not talk about life extension, it seems to me they really kind of inevitably go together uh, pretty well. So just to, again, put this sort of in the context of um, extropian transhumanism, I've written several different versions of the principles of extropy over time. Um, the most popular seems to be version 2.5, so that's the one I'm going to use. That has the, the handy acronym BEST DO IT SO, standing for uh, boundless expansion, self-transformation, dynamic optimism, intelli intelligent technology, and spontaneous order. I think four of those principles are particularly relevant here. Uh, boundless expansion, well, pretty obviously, that's going to be relevant here. Uh, that's not just spatially, but it certainly includes space. It basically means not recognizing any limitations in principle on what we can do and what we can achieve. Uh, dynamic optimism is sort of a, a epistemological, psychological principle that basically says that uh, we can achieve great things, but only if we make the effort to do so. So it's very much counter to a lot of today's culture, especially in the US, but I think in, in, in Europe as well, uh, where we see a lot of pessimism, a lot of doomsaying, a lot of people saying, oh, the, the earth is, is going to crap and uh, we're overpopulating and overpolluting and we're all going to die. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. So Bandler's optimism doesn't just say, oh, everything will be fine. It says things can be fine and we're going to make it that way. So obviously that is very important in, in space because it's an extremely risky endeavor. Uh, there's been a lot of failures, but by persistent efforts we're finally seeing success so you have to be you know quite an optimist like elon musk people like him are willing to uh, put a lot of resources into us and take a lot of risks uh, as we saw one of his rockets blew up, blew up recently which was a lot, a lot of people pounced on that to say see it's not going to work but of course that was quite expected and was part of the testing process uh, intelligent technology is also part of this um, that doesn't just mean more advanced technology it certainly includes that and artificial intelligence but it's also meant to mean the integration of human biology with advanced technologies. And that, a part of, that is kind of part of the transhumanist idea, obviously, of uh, going beyond our current biological genetic boundaries. Uh, and then finally, spontaneous order. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple of minutes. That really is a principle uh, of social, political, economic organization. Uh, without getting too specific, it's essentially saying that the more complex a society, the more we need to actually decentralize and individualize or voluntarize perhaps uh, our interactions. That in a very small group like a kibbutz perhaps in Israel, where you, know, you have a small number of people, you might better run that on a communist lines basically with no property and everything shared that can work okay. Um, you know, in, in a small village, maybe barter might be sufficient. But once you become a, a large country or an international uh, civilization or more than that, you're going to need increasingly to have spontaneous order where you set up certain rules and that, let people develop within those rules. So before I get to a little bit more about spontaneous order and space, uh, why go to space? Or well, I fortunately don't have to say too much about this. I can save some minutes because other speakers have covered this extremely nicely. Uh, one of those obvious reasons, of course, is for resources. 
Um, although I'm, I'm not one of the people who thinks we're running out of resources. I think that's actually a quite incorrect notion. And there's a lot of very good writing these days explaining why that was incorrect. It used to be mostly Julian Simon and a couple of other people making this case. But now there's many more explaining why resources don't really exist on their own. They don't become resources until human creativity and effort actually uh, use those for something. And since human creativity and intelligence, especially as, as augmented, has no obvious limits, it's not obvious that resources are really limited in any meaningful sense. However, of course, there will be certain finite limits to certain materials that we may want more of. So moving out into space, the moon, the asteroids and beyond, uh, and of course the sun itself, as other people have discussed, for energy, provides us with vastly larger amounts of resources for the long term. So I don't think we actually need those in the, in the next few decades, but uh, it's certainly something we should be building on for the future, but we have some pretty grand projects in mind. If we want to build a Dyson sphere, obviously we can't make that out of planet Earth. We're going to need a lot more materials. I think another, uh, the second, apart from resources, another uh, a little more subtle and kind of not easy to grasp, but I think very clear reason, and, and I, again, I think previous speakers have mentioned this, is that we need to go into space because it's an expression of humanity's adventurous spirit. It is, you know, they call it the final frontier. Well, I'd argue about the final part. I think there's all kinds of possible frontiers, but uh, it's, it, is a, it is a very large and wonderful frontier, and it will help to expand the way we think. People often talked about uh, the first images of Earth from space and how that made us feel like we're all on one planet sharing a destiny. But you can kind of turn that around the other way too and realize that it's just one planet. It's a pale blue doctor, as Carl Sagan said. It's just one place uh, among trillions and trillions in the universe. So there's a lot of possibilities for expanding. And if we really think we're stuck on this planet, that we're stuck in decline, uh, that our, our possibilities are getting smaller all the time, that's very depressing. And in fact, we're seeing that very much. Uh, you know, just speaking for the USA alone, because that's what I'm most familiar with, we're seeing uh, increasing rates of depression, uh, children actually freaking out because they think we're going to you know, burn up the planet in the next five years or something. So uh, part of that's because we, we're stuck here and we think there's nowhere else to go. Well, actually, we're not stuck here. And space gives us that, that new uh, frontier, that new possibility. Um, and I have a great, uh, there's a great quote here from H.G. Uh, Wells, Things to Come, which I think, I think Tom can check me on this. I think we actually put this in the very first issue of Extra B in 1988. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely little quote from Things to Come. Um, uh, they're standing out there watching the first rocket being launched. But for man, no rest and no ending. He must go on, conquest beyond conquest. First this little planet with its winds and ways, and then all the laws of mind and matter that restrain him. Then the planets about him, and at last out across immensity to the stars. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. So nice quote, you can substitute. Uh, she, they, for, for he, if you like, but I think it's uh, it still expresses very beautifully this idea that we're just beginning. We're still basically animals kind of rubbing around on the earth. We're barely getting started. There's a huge amount ahead of us, and space is a vital part of that. Now, the third, third of the three main reasons I want to talk about, the one I want to focus on especially, is kind of related to that a little bit, but essentially the idea that the biggest risk to us right now, I think, the growing risk, is that of a stagnation of our culture and our economy. If you look at growth rates, for instance, you see that you know, for most of human history, they were extremely small. Then they bumped up during the Industrial Revolution, then they bumped up again. And more recently, they've been slowing down pretty much everywhere. Uh, Europe actually hasn't grown at all in a number of years now, and the US not very much. Um, other countries, some of the poorer countries that are growing faster, but they've probably reached the same kind of limits. Population uh, is stopped growing in, in large parts of the world and soon in all parts of the world, so you won't have the boost from population growth. Uh, but beyond that, there's a lot of other things that disturb me about what's going on with our culture and the way we're reacting. Uh, we have a huge amount of regulation. I mean, if you look at the, the millions of, of regulations in the US, it's pretty insane. If you look at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, how they've managed to essentially uh, block nuclear power from developing for decades now. Um, I'm personally quite concerned about this happening with AI. I'm hoping we'll, we'll get by with that not happening. But uh, you know, as soon as someone, the very frustrating thing to me is that as soon as we see AI actually becoming a realistic prospect, finally, after many of us have waited decades for this to happen, what is the first reaction? Stop it! Let's stop it right now! Uh, so I, I find this kind of disturbing. I, you know, Obviously, it's a complicated issue, and I wrote a piece uh, on my blog recently on existential opportunity in AI and why... Uh, 
even if there are risks with AI, there are things we can do about that. We have to really basically do it as we develop AI. We, we can't have a perfect kind of platonic solution before you develop it. Um, but also there's massive possibilities for AI, one of which is that it could accelerate the possibilities for us not to die. So in a sense, you know, the existential risk to all of us individually is that we're going to die of old age unless we solve the problem. And uh, as I've been arguing increasingly recently, uh, having watched Life Extension for well over 40 years, we're not making a whole lot of progress and hopefully that will change, but we may need AI to actually dig into our biology and fix these problems. So, you know, to understand it, first of all, and to better fix it. So there are very strong pluses on the uh, existential opportunity side. And uh, I'll put in a link later for on my essay on that particular point. But I am quite worried about this, that really, if you think about it, um, there's an inevitable trend towards bureaucratization. When uh, a country takes over everything and it starts reaching out into all kinds of activities, uh, and regulatory agencies get up, set up. There's now you know, dozens and dozens of main regulatory agencies in the US. What is their incentive? Uh, you know, there's the whole area of economics that studies this. And uh, it's pretty clear the incentive is to keep growing, to add more power, to control more stuff, because that's, that's what the organization does. And it can always find justifications for doing that. Now, the problem is that in the past, there was an escape valve. Right? Um, as we saw with you know, the creation of the United States, people who were not very happy in Europe, who um, wasn't so much economic at that time, there was more religious constraints, they were able to escape, come across the, the ocean and start again in this country with all kinds of uh, social experiments. And they were quite experimental to begin with. The trouble is now you can't do that anymore. Uh, there are some free state projects, but they're very vulnerable because they're surrounded by gigantic governments and states and countries, and they can be crushed pretty easily. Uh, that's another reason I think why we need to get out into space is basically to create room for social experimentation. Um, and I don't have to argue for any particular, well, I'll come back to this point a little bit later, but uh, we don't have to argue for any particular political organization to make this point. It's more a matter of the, of the framework, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, Robert Heinlein, of course, it comes up quite appropriately in this uh, context. He said, when a place gets crowded enough to require IDs, social collapse is not far away. It is time to go elsewhere. The best thing about space travel is, it, is that it made it possible to go elsewhere. So of course, not many people have gone elsewhere yet, but we need to improve on that. Um, and it'll be a long time before we actually have real societies in space. Hopefully not too long. Again, if AI helps to uh, you know, crunch the numbers and find better means of propulsion and better ways of protecting ourselves from radiation and all the other issues, uh, hopefully that will accelerate greatly. We'll have something of a exponential growth in the real sense. I get tired of people saying exponential when they don't really mean that, but a true exponential growth in the number of people in space. Robert Zubrin, of course, everybody I'm sure here will be familiar with. This is from uh, his 1997, The Significance of the Martian Frontier. He said, uh, three societies are the exception in human history. They have only existed during the four centuries of frontier expansion of the West, a brief shining moment in an otherwise endless chronicle of human misery. That history is now over. A new frontier must be opened. Mars beckons. Well, I'm not so sure about the Mars part. I'm more in favor of actually of uh, sort of uh, freewheeling space colonies, uh, kind of O'Neill type approaches, but whatever, I think, you know, all these different possibilities are good, but his main point really is, yeah, we need to better get into space um, because otherwise we're facing a real point in human history where the recent, you know, the last few centuries of expansion and improvement could come to an end. It's not at all implausible. So on the one hand, we have the Kurtzwillians who think apparently inevitable technological progress will continue to transform everything. On the other side, we're seeing tremendous numbers of forces slowing things down, dragging them down, uh, stopping things from happening. So in a sense, we've got this little window possibly where we have to get going, get off this planet so that we can uh, you know, put some competitive pressure on the Earth societies to uh, allow more experimentation and growth. Now, another part of this, another part of the evidence to me of this danger of stagnation in our society is the widespread acceptance or sympathy for the precautionary principle. Uh, the precautionary principle, I'm not going to try and define it, it's got a number of different definitions, but the essential idea is that uh, if any new technology or a productive method um, might have some significant risk, then you're not allowed to do it until you can prove that it's safe. Now, I think, you know, most smart people will immediately start having reasons to object to that. Um, and, and we're seeing this very much in the AI thing. That's why I talked about that in the context of the precautionary principle, which is my alternative. Um, with AI, if you actually took the precautionary principle seriously, we would never have AI because there's no way you can prove that it's, it's perfectly safe. Uh, we're never going to completely solve the alignment problem just by sitting in our armchairs without actually building the things and experimenting with them. 
Um, you know, you can imagine, to take an extreme example, back in the very early days of humanity, uh, someone, you know, started the first fire. They, they saw lightning strike and they bought that or they rubbed some wood together and got a fire. You just imagine, you know, one cave person sitting next to another and one saying, well, I've got to invoke the precautionary principle here. Fire could burn us. It could burn down our dwellings. It could uh, burn down the forest. So we're not allowed to have any any fire. So, so much for civilization right at the beginning. So it applies very generally. People have tried to make it a little more reasonable, but it's a fundamentally flawed principle in my view. Uh, and that's why instead I created the proactionary principle, which starts with a strong affirmation of the need for progress and advancement. It doesn't throw away all caution, but it tries to put those in perspective and provide some more specific principles for evaluating risk and the basis on which we do that. Uh, it's not actually unique. I recently came across uh, something called permissionless innovation, um, and the author of that, uh, I'm very much on board with, we think, in a very similar way. And he's written some really good things about regulation and, and, and these problems of, uh, of the culture. So we've got the precautionary principle, which is actually embodied in the European uh, Union Constitution, by the way. So it's something that's very hard to get away from there. But it's actually in practice, whether it's mentioned or not, is embodied in a lot of US regulation and government as well. Um, it's kind of interesting now that, um, for instance, environmentalists who have actually used the precautionary principle to stop nuclear power and pipelines and all kinds of other things they don't like, and now feeling the effects of it themselves because they want to build lots of wind farms and solar, and they're finding now they're running into the permitting problems where it can take years and years and huge amounts of money to get those through. So the, maybe that'll help to reverse that their uh, support for that principle because it's now being a problem for them. Uh, um, yeah, so one thing we've seen there is basically a lack of nuclear energy is something I've actually been in favor of since since I was a teenager. Apparently, I was the only person in the country, as far as I could tell, at that time, who was a member of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, but also pro-nuclear power. Uh, when I went on a, a march when I was like maybe 16 or so down to London uh, on a train with you know, thousands of, of other protesters against nuclear weapons, when I had conversations with people and I said, oh, yeah, I think nuclear power is a great idea. They look at me like I was some kind of insane alien, like they're both nuclear, dude. Well, no, they're, they're very different kinds of things. So that's going to be very odd. Um, but really, there's been uh, in this country very little nuclear power development, which is a shame because if you have, if you really think that global warming is a problem and that we're causing it, why on earth are you not supporting nuclear power? That that basically is the, the zero, the true zero emissions, or as close to it as possible as you can get. Um, and it's also far safer than people seem to realize. But a whole other topic. Uh, so. With the slowing of growth, the precautionary principle, uh, growth of bureaucracies, now fear of AI, which you know, see how that could go. We're seeing, I think, an inward turn in our culture. People are spending all their time staring at their phones, uh, reading social media. They're not, they're, as other people complain, they're not really doing things. Like Peter Thiel's talked about this. You know, uh, I forget what his, his thing was, but we, we wanted flying cars and we got what, 32 characters or whatever it is. So basically, we're kind of turning inward. We're spending our time on education, uh, on getting annoyed with each other over politics. We don't seem to be building very much, with a few exceptions. Uh, so that's a very disturbing development. And... Uh, it's not obvious to me that uh, that would turn around on its own. I think that's something we have to push very hard for. And I think space is part of that. I was just a few days ago, I was thinking of a kind of a, a, a funny contrast here. Well, actually, it's kind of a distressing contrast. I went down to um, the TSA um, office inside of Staples to get my uh, pre-check pass because I've been trying to get global entry for 11 months now. And again, the bureaucracy is incredibly slow and I've given up on that. So I applied for the pre-check instead. And um, I was standing there for an hour and a half as you tend to do in, in these kind of things. Um, and just thinking about it, and I was thinking about how people who came to America, the early Americans think what they had to go through. They had to get on a, a rickety boat with a large possibility of dying across the ocean. When they landed here, if they, you know, any distance of travel, they had to risk getting killed by other people or by nature, by starvation. Uh, even when they settled, they had the possibility of their farm failing. Uh, it was very high risk, and yet people still came here and, and did that. Today, it's almost incomprehensible to imagine people doing that. So as I was waiting in that line, someone pulled out a stool to sit on, and the TSA administrator comes and says, you can't sit on that stool. We said, well, why not? Well, because someone fell off one last week. Seriously? You're saying we can't sit on a stool? It's too dangerous to sit on a stool now. Is that how far we've gone down? So these, <laughs> that's just obviously an anecdote, but it's, it's a very disturbing example of the, the trend in our culture uh, as we turn increasingly inward. So what I would suggest to is let's dump the precautionary principle, let's adopt something like the proactionary principle. Uh, Let's certainly think about existential risk. Let's also balance that by thinking about existential opportunity, as I discussed recently on my blog. 
uh, existential opportunity recognizes that technologies like AI don't just have risks, they have enormous upsides. They can help us to solve problems we've been wrestling with for many years, critically among which is aging and death. And if we don't allow it to happen, uh, we are causing the death of billions of people. They will die without this being solved. So, you know, we can speculate whether AI is going to eat all our atoms for some reason, but we are absolutely going to die unless we make progress in this front. And I don't see that being emphasized sufficiently. It's not just a matter of AI making you know, more entertainment or uh, you know, trivial stuff. It's about our, our basic existence. Now, I'm not really going to talk about, uh, I think it's been covered enough to talk about why biology is not really especially suitable for space. Uh, and the kinds of changes there. Instead, what I want to do to uh, to wrap up on this is to talk about, uh, to me, the most exciting part of space as a new frontier is the possibility for real social, economic, and political experimentation. Uh, now, I like to refer back to, to give a credit here to Robert Nozick. Uh, some of you might have read his classic 1974 book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. Um, probably a lot of people who picked up that book didn't get to the last part of it, which is unfortunate. It has a section called A Framework for Utopia. Now, I'm not a big keen, I'm not a, a big fan of the term utopia. I, I prefer extropia because utopia um, is sort of a perfect platonic stagnant state where you've reached an end goal. And I don't really believe in that. Extropia is more an evolving, continually improving society. But uh, you know, that aside, his basic idea is setting aside all his arguments for a particular form of governance. He's saying, what we could create using, I think this will get into what Tom's going to talk about, uh, by having certain basic rules in place, sort of meta rules, if you like, within that context, people can then form their own societies, so long as you have relatively easy entry and exit, which we don't have today. Again, that's the problem. Within the US, you have that to some extent by changing between you know, internal states, um, but really not a whole lot. You're still governed by the same basic legal system. But imagine we got into space through hundreds, thousands, eventually millions of different colonies out there, they could have radically different rules. And if you had some meta rule that, you know, you could not be allowed to, to be trapped inside a society, you had the right to exit, um, you would see a lot of competition for social rules and economic rules. So we may argue about, you know, how much government intervention is needed or what kind, um, but why not try it all? Because right now we're basically using a lot of very similar systems in the world. Uh, why not try lots of radically different systems as we started to do in, in the early states of America? Uh, and see what works. So, um, well, just a quote from from uh, from Nozick here from page 307. In our actual world, what corresponds to the model of possible worlds is a wide and diverse range of communities, which people can enter if they are admitted, leave if they wish to, shape according to their wishes. A society in which utopian experimentation can be tried, different styles of life can be lived, and alternative visions of the good can be individually and jointly pursued. So he's very suggesting the idea of the minimal state as the framework for utopias. So you can have a meta minimal state, which is very minimally restrictive, but then you can create states where you can you know, voluntarily join, which could be extremely restricted. You could have you know, fundamentalist Christian communities or fundamentalist Islamic communities. You could have uh, you know, various types of transhumanist communities, um, yeah, maybe even communities where you're required to upgrade to be a member, uh, to upgrade your brain and so on. All kinds of possibilities, but so long as we have uh, entry and exit, or as Nozick puts it, designs and filters, you know, different ways of creating and different ways of filtering out societies, that could lead to a lot of you know, accelerated social experimentation. And being a big fan of Karl Popper, I'll put it in Popperian terms, that essentially uh, where you know, he talked about conjectures and refutations, that we conjecture a scientific theory and then we test it and we attempt to refute it, and so long as it survives as refutations, we keep using it. Uh, we're not doing a lot of conjecturing in our societies anymore. We're all stuck with the same kind of, pretty much the same mix of mixed economies, uh, not really trying anything very radical. Uh, in space, there's a possibility with basically infinite real estate or empty estate, whatever you want to call it, of a very large number of social experiments. And with relative ease of, of entrance and exit, I think you'd see uh, a lot more social evolution, social correction, if you like. Uh, it will be turbocharged. So to me, that's one of the most exciting things and when people ask me, you know, I've done so many interviews about cryonics and life extension, but say about cryonics, where people say, well, why do you want to come back? What is what do you think you'll do when you come back? And, uh, you know, my prime answer is really when I come back, if someone has already done all this work, I'll join with people like Tom and Max Borders and various other people in trying to create this framework for extropia, uh, to, to, to create this uh, meta system within which we can explore all kinds of different systems and select them out and see which ones seem to work for us. And maybe we'll never agree on which ones work the best, which is fine. We'll better continue doing our own thing. 
But to me, that's the most exciting prospect is because we're really hidebound on this planet. We're kind of stuck geographically. Uh, we're stuck by locked into existing institutions. It's very hard to reverse course. So the basic way is to get out of the system and restart, and then people can see what the possibilities are. So that's really is my conclusion. Onward, upward, outward, and hope to see you in space. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Max. I'm going to listen to your talk again tomorrow and then again the day after tomorrow. It was great. Huh? Uh, I'm afraid that uh, unfortunately we don't have time for questions, but uh, you all know how to contact Max. Huh? So that, uh, oh, we have uh, the two co-founders of Extropy Magazine speaking at the same event one after the other. That's something great. Huh? And uh, so I'd like to give the floor to Tom Bell. Floor is yours, Tom. Thank you again, Max. Thank you, Julio. Good to see you, Max. Good to see so many um, old friends. Uh, some of you I haven't seen for years. Is that really Keith Henson? Wow. Um, and Gabe. Anyhow, great to see you and uh, others of you. Pleased to meet new friends interested in space. I'm going to talk today about really a kind of technology. You don't tend to think of law as a technology, but I do. I view writing laws very much like coding. I used to do a little bit of coding, decided my comparative advantage was more in the legal direction. And that's what I ran off and did after Max and I did our wonderful work together. By the way, it was great to hear Max again. It was like hearing a favorite old song, you know, from back in the day. And um, by the way, Max, you might want to check the chat because you were right. It's H.G. Uh, Wells' first issue at the very end of that issue. And I, I provided links to it so our, our colleagues here can check out really one of the best magazines ever, gotta say that. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about ULEX in space, ULEX in space. Let me share my screen um, and you can see ULEX itself. Now ULEX is an open source legal system that I created for clients in Honduras. We were working, oh, about nine years ago now under the prior statute. So to take a step back, Honduras, this, um, moderately sized country in Central America has a very innovative system for creating special jurisdictions. And that's kind of the space I work in now. I'm both a law professor and a lawyer and my lawyerly work with, is with special jurisdictions and I basically create legal systems for them. And uh, in so doing, I found it useful starting in Honduras under a prior statute and I'll show you uh, what's happening now in Honduras to create ULEX. And what is it? Open source legal system. That is a public domain picture of the plant ULEX, happily, it's a couple of things. And basically ULEX is a collection of private rule sets curated uh, to provide a basic kernel of governance. It doesn't do everything a government needs to do, but a government does need a kernel of rules. And that's what ULEX provides. My model was a Linux. Uh, and so this is open source. And it was very careful. I was very careful to use only private sources of rules because in Honduras, they're a little prickly about importing foreign law. They've had it, as so many countries have, uh, forced on them more than once. And they're kind of sick of it. <laughs> and I knew that if I marched in carrying a flag uh, saying, you know, here's the law of Canada or America, or, it, it would it would raise hackles. And anyhow, I don't think political systems give us the best rules. So all of these rules are either from, well, I wrote some of them, but mostly they're from private sources. So let's just take a quick look at ULEX so you have a feel for what it does. And then I'll go on and show you some applications. It's being used now in the real world. And basically where I'm gonna end up this talk is saying, and we could use it in space too. We need to make some changes. I invite your thoughts, but that is the idea. Oh, by the way, let me make sure I'm checking the time. Yeah, I'll have to go fast. So strap in, strap in friends. Here's ULEX, procedural rules. The important thing to note here are these rules for choosing judges and holding appeals. There's more to them, but the heart of it is, and this to me is the most important part, is it allows parties who don't like each other, maybe wanna really hurt each other to find the peace. And they can do this without someone standing in the background with a club saying, make up or I'm gonna beat your brains out. They do it because it's mutually advantageous and fair to both sides. That's what these rules are designed to offer contesting parties. That's very important when you don't have someone with a big club standing behind you. I mean, I think it's important for other reasons, but just practically speaking, far flung space communities are going to be very far from the centers of power. And they will need to, as colonies or settlements on the frontier is all, have always had to do, they're gonna to have to make the peace themselves. You can read the rules and figure out how it works. Basically these rules, at least these first important three ones are drawn from international business practices. 
So these have been tried and tested. They are commonly used in international business transactions where millions of dollars are on the line because why? Because those parties are self-interested and they're smart. And so basically those rules have evolved. This I had to create to allow a system of appeals, which is complicated, but robust is the idea. I'm not gonna get into how that works. That's a little more sui generis. I had to create this because I, I really am aiming to create a decentralized legal system that you can take with you wherever you go. And you can, as long as you have a few people, you have to have a few people, right? You can't just be you and your contestant. You have to have someone to judge your dispute. Anyhow, that's the idea. So those are procedural rules. There's more here. There's this, uh, to, to me, important judicial promise that every judge has to make. I really don't like a system where judges are above the law. No, no, it's just inconsistent. It's not logical on top of everything else. So judges have to make this promise. And by the way, I drew from African customary law, the fact that they have to pay double damages. If a judge breaches his or her, or its, if it's an AI, um, promises, uh, then double damages have to be paid. Okay, let's move on to substantive rules. There's basically procedural rules, how you settle disputes, substantive rules, which are the rules that are applied by those settling disputes. And at the very end, there's some meta rules, which I'll just glance at here and just say, those are not so interesting to us right now, the meta rules, but they're important kind of a programming thing. Let's look quickly at the substantive rules, just to give you a flavor of what's going on. So basically, my, my mom is librarian, role model for me in a lot of ways, and I pictured myself as being a librarian in a way. I walked in the library, the basket on my arm, and maybe a cart, because some of these books are really big, saying, I need tort law. I need really a bunch of good tort rules that are easy to read, well thought through, not, not flavored with political bias. That's one reason I don't trust political systems to generate rules. Oh, look here, it's the American Law Institute's Restatement of Torch Second, which I've actually taught. And so I know it really well, and it's excellent. It's excellent. It's a private body. I know it has American in its name, and I know it means North America, although Canadians and Britons are welcome, whatever. American Law Institute, private organization, created not just that, but all these rules. They did these for product liability. They got some property rules. They got rules for leases. Look at the detail here, friends. Contracts. I love this one. This is really good, except for except for a few rules. <laughs> Sometimes you want to edit. Mostly it's really great. And then I use the common law, the uh, uniform commercial codes. These are from the ALI and the ULC, private bodies, ton of those. Natural persons, we got things for adoption, for marriage, for probate, business organizations, corporations, LLCs. There's some other stuff here about electronic recording of documents when people become adults. I don't know exactly what we're going to do with AIs there. Anyhow, it's open source. You can take it, work with it, adapt it. Let's took, take a look now at some applications, applications. So I started this for a project in Honduras and that project, I've actually worked on three projects in Honduras under two statutes. <laughs> and the last one has finally kicked in. This is Prospera ZA. That's Zonas Empleo y Desarrollo Especial. I think that's what it stands for. It's a special employment and um, economic development region in Honduras under this statute, national statute, that basically allows for the creation of a private legal system. And I worked on building that. I brought in ULEX and did some other things and it has survived. I can certainly say that it's complicated. The current Honduran government is not friendly at all. It's actually quite hostile to Prospera and the uh, at least the other ZA I know about. There's actually two other ZAs. Anyhow, this runs um, ULEX. Here it is, the Rotan Common Law Code. Now, to be precise, it runs part of ULEX. It runs the substantive rules. And where do those begin? Uh, procedural law. See, they use their own procedures. And I, I like what they did. Oops, that's what I want. I like what they did because they needed to, to stay. They have a saying in Hollywood. They needed to stay more conventional than they could have gone. They could have gone more extreme and radical, and I'm glad they didn't. They have a saying in Hollywood, don't have time traveling wizards. And of course that rule has been broken. But the idea is that if your movie already has time travelers, don't throw in wizards, it's just too much. And a similar thing, I think Prosper calculated here. They go, wow, okay, we're kind of out there on the edge building in this ULEX kernel. I mean, it makes sense to us and we think people will get it, but it's different. So let's have a pretty conventional arbitration system. And they do. Anyhow, you can see here they got, there, there it is, there it is. There's a tort law, the restatement, second of torts, and all the stuff we looked at before. So there's ULEX right there, a kernel, not the whole thing, but a kernel of the Rotan Common Law Code. And actually, I'm going, I have a meeting later today, and now I've left that project, and now I, I'm helping out a, a bioscience company in Prospera that is advocating its own regulations 
designed primarily to allow that company to engage in life extension science and uh, therapy. Uh, but it'll be of general applications. I wish me luck going before the Prosper Council today to argue on behalf of that client for the adoption of these new regulations that'll help anti-aging kick in in this very free jurisdiction. The Catawba Digital Economic Zone is a more recent one. This is a, um, a entirely virtual zone set up by the Catawba Indian Nation, which is based in the Carolinas. They have reservation lands on both sides of the border between North and South Carolina. And I had to help them to build their legal system. And it has the um, enabling le legislation here. And there it is, you know, they got, uh, where do we wanna go? Here's tort law, general provisions. So you should see, there it is, ALA. So they did the organization different and that's great. You know, that's, that's the idea. I helped them integrate this in a kind of a more American system. Um, great project. In fact, <laughs> I just thought of this. this is what a great day for meeting people. I'll be talking today with um, the guy I worked with to build that. And we're, we're talking about another project. Um, uh, that's Joe McKinney. He and I, together with some other folks, um, have the uh, Center for Decentralized Government. And we're going to do a project for cryptocurrency helping them to write a constitution. But that's not quite what we want to talk about here. We want to talk about space. And here's one more towards space. So you're saying, oh, come on, Tom, talk about space, talk about space. I'm going to talk about space. But this is all preparation for space because to me, space is going to have to be, as long as we have the, the limit of C, as long as we can't travel or communicate faster than light, eventually as we spread through the universe, we're going to end up with special jurisdictions is how I view them. You know, there'll be somebody on some far flung planet. It won't be like Star Wars where you run everything from some big planet at the center of the galaxy. Ridiculous. But anyhow, um, they're going to be special jurisdictions. They're going to need their own legal systems. We want to make sure they're fair, robust, effective, efficient, and free society. Now, this one has not launched yet, but this one is farther towards a full-blown community because Prosper is great, but they don't get to do their own criminal code. It's really still part of the Honduran government, given a lot of latitude, but basically just in the civil sphere. Um, and then the Catawba Digital Economic Zone is purely virtual. They also don't have any criminal law. Um, well, it's a little more complicated than that, but their own legal system doesn't have its own bespoke criminal law, okay, in the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. Um, free society, their idea is to, they say here, purchasing sovereignty. That's not quite how it's going to work. It will be instead a treaty of cessation and mutual recognition, where the um, host government says, we worked out a deal, so we're doing this voluntarily, in fact, happily. We're ceding our jurisdiction, our claims of sovereignty over this period, uh, this, this space, and you can move in, and we will recognize you as a sovereign. That's the goal, and it's here that you can read about this. So this one has not launched yet. We might have a big public announcement later, probably in the fall, about progress we've made towards that goal of finding a host country to deal with. And I've been working on this legal system for oh, years now, years. It's been super fun. And it inclu includes ULEX, but it also includes the whole suite of governing rules. So this one, I got the bill from the ground up. Other people working with me, of course, of course. Um, and it will have its own criminal law and its own criminal uh, justice system. Um, I remember Max and I used to wonder about criminal law. I don't know where he ended up. Uh, libertarians often have wondered, do you really need criminal law? Do you really need criminal law? There's something brutish about it. Um, I don't know where Max has ended up on that. My own view is probably uh, criminal law is necessary in at least a human society. And I, I bet for other agents as well. Self-interested agents living together in a world of scarce resources with therefore conflicting ends. They certainly need rules. Um, and they might need something very much like criminal law and free society will have that. Not ready to launch yet. All right, let's start getting towards space. So here is, um, this is, uh, used to be called the Instit Institute for Competitive Governance. Now it's called, uh, we changed the name. It's the Decentralized Governance Institute. Anyhow, this is our um, publication. We put out the Journal of Special Jurisdictions and in it, I have a paper I often publish there. It's convenient. It is peer edited. It's not just, you know, oh, I want to publish this. We have peers and they give me comments and they help me improve my papers. And you're invited to submit your papers too. If you have papers on special jurisdictions, Max, send us something. Peer edited, no guarantees. Anyhow, so this is about ULEX as a rule set for non-territorial governance. You can read it here. Uh, you know, it, it's available online. And the idea was uh, Ulex would be really good for um, what we might call decentralized protocol communities. 
communities like Cardano or um, it's, it's kind of a community around Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's a special case. I have another paper I wrote about this. It's basically governance in decentralized protocol communities. Um, and basically the argument here is, oh, you like should be great. Well, firstly, the argument was these communities need some law. Look, I'm not a push people around kind of guy. I'm a lawyer, right? I work with people to reach agreement on things. And I'm telling you, people need rules. In fact, my argument is people love rules. They do. Even your wild haired libertarians love rules. They're just really picky about them. They want rules they have chosen. But I think humans love rules. They just need to have the right ones. I'm trying to help them get there. I think ULEX could help these decentralized protocol communities find the rules they need because they will, they are having disputes. They could even have crimes. But they'll certainly have disputes, at least civil disputes. And right now it's kind of up in the air. You have a fight with somebody about access to Cardano tokens. It's a mess. Take it from a guy who's worked in this field. So trying to civilize that frontier, and that'll get us ready for space. So that's all my slides. I'm now going to wrap up with some comments about um, space and invite your questions if we have any. I guess we're running over, but I really would like to hear your questions. So you can see ULEX, this thing I've been working on, is useful for special jurisdictions. It's being tried right now. So far, it seems to be working pretty well. Um, how can we use this? to get to space. Um, I think I've already explained the basics of the idea. If you have these far-flung communities and the limits of the speed of light really keep them separated from each other, you can't send a criminal back to the home planet to have her tried. You can't even have some administrator on the home planet saying, you know, on the digital hollow phone, um, well, here's what you should do. And it's just not gonna work. Um, so these communities are gonna have to govern themselves. That's uh, something ULEX can help with, really more the free society legal system, because it's the full blown. Remember, ULEX is just a kernel. The most popular operating system in the world is the Android operating system. And yes, it is an operating system, even though it's on a smartphone. And it has a Linux kernel. So that's my goal for ULEX. I wanted to be a kernel in all these legal systems to help them work well and also to allow them to interface. So the Catawba Digital Economic Zone is going to be able to cooperate and do business with the Prospera. Uh, ZA more easily because they got the same kernel of rules, the same way my phone can talk to all these other Android phones. So that's the goal. Um, now, of course, in space, it'll be more asynchronous, but it's still important because communities in space will be bumping up against each other sometimes, might even be living in intermingled communities. They need ways to interface so they don't kill each other. And of course, we'll have to adapt these rules of, of ULEX, really the rules of like the family law when you have AIs. So that work has not been done. So friends, there's some good work ahead there if you're interested in joining uh, that effort. What else are we gonna need in space? We can use the free society suite. It's a fully, uh, it's a set of rules. It's very decentralized. It will include, free society will include some criminal law. Don't get me started on that. I'm still a little worried about criminal law. It's a tough one. Anyhow, I'm more of a civil law guy myself. What else are we going to need in space? Well, I tell you, you know, it's funny. When I was in law school, when I was a young lawyer, I thought international law, what a joke. You know, these people sit around and talk, and it's not even law at all. It's like a structural anarchy. All these nation states trying to take over each other's territories. It's absurd. It's like a bunch of dinosaurs. I'm a mammal. Um, but now basically all I do is international law, at least for free society, because you have to figure out how to get this community to live peaceably in this world of dinosaurs, right? You can't aggravate the dinosaurs around you. You got to interface nicely. And of course, there's wonderful people and communities and institutions and values across the world, even in very status places. You can't go hating everybody. We need to get along with the, the, the communities, the sovereigns near us and communities in space will have that same problem. And they'll need something like, so here's again, some really fun works coming up because we need to update things like rules of navigation. There are all kinds of international treaties for rules of navigation on the sea and in the air, like the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which does other things too. It marks out kind of space. So we need a, we're gonna need some kind of convention for the law of space that says, you know, maybe up to our toposphere, it's exclusively our territory. And you can have free passage in any place where Actually, the border of the atmosphere, I've had to look at this, is actually quite ambiguous, and the legal definition is not the same as the technical one. we got to sort that out. It's kind of a mess. We need scientists and lawyers to figure out how to upgrade the UN Convention Law of the Sea, that something like those rules, to outer space, so that we don't have spaceships flying in, as they might be doing right now, trespassing on Earth. Harumph, they should stay outside the, litho the, the toposphere and, and ask for permission to enter, right? Also, the International Convention on Salvage. And this is a set of rules that um, governs what happens if you find a ship in distress 
or um, sunken. And there are obligations of rendering aid in the case of a ship in distress, for example. We could probably use things like that in space. The people I'm flying around with up there, I want to, people, the entities that we're mingling with in space, I hope they'll be treating each other very politely. And more than that, they'll render aid in emergencies and that there are no reavers. No reavers, please. Um, although we should expect pirates, and there's some international law about that, and there's not an international convention so much. It's addressed in different international conventions. But anyhow, Seabed Arms Control Treaty. Now, this is a treaty that says, hey, nations of the world, don't go placing nuclear weapons on the sea floor. We're not even talking about exploding them. Just don't do that. And you can imagine the analog in space. I'll let you guys work it out. Um, the Convention on International Civil Aviation. Um, I'm not happy with all the rules there, but I do think rules are needed. And this uh, governs things like overflight rights, uh, landing rights, whether or not a vessel uh, that lands with fuel in its tank has to claim that in customs, I mean, an international vessel. So similar problems are gonna arise in space. And I'll wrap it up by saying, uh, to hearken again back to some of the, the really wonderful things that Max said, it's so wonderful to hear those again. I don't have that enough in my life. My life now is like I'm basically working on this stuff all the time and I don't get to think about the big ideas. It's very refreshing, kind of grounding to, to go back to the source. Um, so to return to what Max was saying about spontaneous orders, it won't surprise you that, um, yay, I say, to that idea applied in space. That's how it'll probably have to be. Again, you can't have a centralized planned order when you have civilization spanning light years. As far as I can see, it just won't work. Um, so they're gonna have to be individual, differentiated communities, sometimes intermingling, and wonderful things will arise from that. The idea with a spot, when sometimes terrible things, the idea with a spontaneous order is it's an epiphenomenon. We have all these individual nodes of activity and arising out of it, sort of the way consciousness arises out of the individual actions of neurons, arising out of it are complex patterns, which are uh, discernible, perhaps we can't fully appreciate them, but which are powerful, which merit our attention, which could control our fates, epiphenomena, that's a spontaneous order. You actually could be part of that, um, along with some other legal work that needs to happen uh, so that communities in space can live amongst each other peaceably and have peace within their boundaries as well. And out of that could come wonderful things. Let's hope for that. Thank you, my friends. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Tom. Inspiring indeed. I'm just going to allow a couple of questions for Tom before uh, switching the recording off because I'm uh, quite concerned about the storage limits in Zoom. But I see that uh, Inara has a question and uh, she gets to ask it first. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you for taking the time with us today. I'm fascinated by this concept of how we're going to create laws and what the structures will look like going forward. I was on the Asgardia projects in the very beginning, and I was inspired by it because I saw the possibility of figuring out what our future space society could look like. Unfortunately, in my opinion, that all fell very short and um, not in the right direction. Are there any projects currently on the table that you're aware of that are figuring it out that could be the shape of things to come in a way that's great for us? Uh, it, with specific regard to space? Exactly. So in, in the sense of a space-faring civilization, are there any projects that you think are figuring out the societal <laughs> structures, especially the legal system that we'll need? Yeah, especially the legal system. I mean, this Orion's arm thing I heard about right here sounded very, uh, very ambitious and uh, exhausting. But yeah, I didn't hear any talk about law. And basically my answer to you is, I really don't know of any ongoing credible uh, efforts to undertake this important work. Uh, maybe I'll get involved someday. My hands are full here on Earth right now and in cyberspace. Um, yeah, and I've talked with some people. They come to me once in a while and I talk with them and then they go off and I guess they disappear. That's a, I, I, wish I, I, I mean, I won't say that's bad news. I think it's actually kind of cool news and you get to go do it. Go people, <laughs> go to space. I have a question actually, Tom, it might be too um, not ambitious enough for you, but uh, what about, are there, are, do you have any thoughts about what we should do about the, um, I'm not sure the name of the law, but the moon treaty, basically, where we're not allowed, it's basically communism on the moon, not allowed to establish any property there, and I'd worry if that might get extended to asteroids and so on. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, what we should be putting pressure on and on who to pressure to get that changed? That is, that is uh, very practical, um, and it's an important issue. I totally can see that. I have not immersed myself in it. I have um, 
looked at a few of the provisions that are a little ambiguous. There's some wiggle room there for lawyers. Um, and I'll just say it might not be as bad as it seems because private actors, especially from sovereigns that have not signed the treaty can go a very long way. Um, and I think we need something better. Maybe right now, nothing at all, which is what you get if a country hasn't signed the treaty is, is, is best if that's the alternative. But ultimately, yeah, it'd be better to have a treaty yeah, that's another thing we need. We need a treaty that not just allows uh, private parties to go out and exploit uh, space resources, but eventually uh, has a controlled way for these communities to become sovereign. We don't want to have to have a civil war or a war of independence every time one of these communities moves far away. So yeah, some issues there are really important, Max. Maybe we'll get to work on them. Are there other questions for Tom? Let's have one more. So if nobody raises his hand, I would say something. Uh, you know, all these things you say, the ULEX and uh, freesociety.com, um, and they, to me, they are among the best expression that I have seen produced by our between brackets Western civilization. And I'd like very much to see these things implemented here on Earth and after that in space. But there is now some kind of a race to space. Mm, you know, US and the West on one hand, China on the other hand, uh, reading the news, seeing what is happening, even in spite of some uh, real advances that have been made by people like Elon Musk. I am by no means confident that uh, China will not win this race. Because you know, they are moving step by step, steady, slowly, but always in the same direction. And the kind of political system that they have is much easier to make uh, long-term uh, plans and make long-term decisions. So that I see that there is a very clear danger that uh, China will do it first. If they establish themselves first on the moon, then on Mars, perhaps they will own the solar system for the rest of this century. Now, since we are, um, cannot speak for everyone, at least you and I are libertarians who want to see these things happening here and in the universe, what should we do to prevent that from happening? Hmm. Um, to prevent that from happening. Well, I think we can put a happier gloss on uh, your prediction, which, by the way, I share. If you've studied at all the history of China, you know, for most of human history, it was the preeminent civilization. And maybe it's apt that they call it the celestial kingdom. Um, and Chinese communities have appeared on every frontier. and They are important um, uh, people in those communities. They're often treated badly, but they bring typically merchandise and hard labor. So. And, you know, I'm rooting for the humans and the Chinese are going to probably get in space and do pretty darn well. But I think it would be a disaster if they took communism with them. One virtue of space is because there's room to move about and escape central authorities. I think there's actually a chance for finally the Chinese people to flourish, um, to escape communism and to take their many virtues to freer places and do great things. So, yay, go Chinese and get the heck away from communism. It, it'll kill you. I mean, yeah, it's terrible. Um, but what can we do? I mean, let's not let them have all the fun. What can we do to get up there? Uh, of course, you mentioned, uh, Julio, um, the many launches happening now, the space race and uh, the private sector is killing it in America. The Chinese have nothing so far on Elon Musk and may it remain so. But let us not pretend, I wish I could say it's true, but let us not pretend that all happened from just the private sector. The government was involved, United States government and other governments. and. Uh, I think we have something going on there that's pretty good. Let's not screw that up. Let's try to build on that success and uh, give the Chinese and other countries a run for their money. Competition is good. You know, there's enough room for everybody. Um, maybe the Chinese, you know, it's an interesting take, Julie. I don't know about that. And I would worry about the Chinese controlling the solar system. And I do agree. You get the moon, that's the high ground. Uh, that could give way too much leverage to communists and they could remain communist on the moon. That's just a short call to earth. Definitely something to worry about, yeah. Um, but maybe uh, we'll just have to outrace them to get to the far-flung corners of this solar system and then other solar systems. And um, 
don't know. Well, we'll see what the future brings. I hope I'm around. I hope you are too, Max. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll see what happens. Tom, the, the uh, definitive uh, article on the Moon Treaty is called Star Laws. And it was written clear back, I don't know, 1980 close. So you might, it's, it's, it's uh, linked off of the Wikipedia page for me if you want to look it up. Okay. But, uh, it was in Reason Magazine and it, is, it right. essentially made all the arguments that, that were against the, the Moon Treaty uh, at that time. <clears throat> hmm. But I, all right. I, I, speaking of China, um, I really don't think China is going to be nearly as much of a problem as you think. They have made a decision to sit down really hard on AI, and AI roughly doubles or maybe even triples the productivity of engineers, which means mm. that effectively the US has, we, we had about a third as many engineers as the Chinese did, and now we have about the same number effectively because of the, of the effect of AI. You can't blame the Chinese for sitting down on AI because who knows what it will do in terms of messing up their their social system, but it will be interesting to watch. I agree, and I do blame them. Doggone it! Stopping freedom of speech and access to AI. I'm, I'm happy to cast blame on those tyrants. Harumph. Well, don't be too sure about that because AIs may turn out to be the worst tyrants we've ever had. Mm, let's okay, not start let's, that uh, Let's just. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, let's not start the debate here, especially because we will discuss uh, all these things having to do with AI and what's likely to happen or not in the December colloquium. Huh? December 14, you are all invited. I will have to cut the recording now because I'm afraid of the storage limit. Which, okay. uh, so that uh, uh, thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for listening.